We got a lot on the plate this week. Peter Chris, his last performance in the U.S. The New York Kiss Expo, Mark was there. Gene Simmons, you guys fell for it. He got you all hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> oh, and a special guest. A special guest who was there before Kiss even existed. We go way back. Set set the time machine, Mr. Peabody. All right, Sherman. <laughs> <laughs> this is Three Sides of the Coin. Talking all things Kiss. I want to rock and roll all night. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode. Three Sides of the Coin. <laughs> the Coin. You can only do that for a couple more weeks. <laughs> I'm one of your three co-hosts, Michael Branvold. As always, I'm joined by Tommy Summers, Mark Cicchini, Woo-hoo. and the public domain metal horns. For now. For now. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. That's not right, Mark. That's not right. Huh. You did this. It's the thumb out. Yeah. It's, that makes it's all before, you know. the difference. Before the Gene Simmons Gestapo comes and takes us. <laughs> Give me my nickel. <laughs> okay, so so can you guys guess what the first topic is? We're gonna we're gonna do a little riff on right now. No. This, this. <laughs> I'll let, let we can go around and and give our impressions, and I'll, I'll start. I think it is the biggest laugh in the freaking world that literally the entire world is got their panties in a twist because Gene filed a trademark for this it, it just blows my mind and and listen i can tell you guys from experience um i trademarked three sides of the coin i used a lawyer so including lawyer fees and application fees it was like 700 bucks to trademark it. if you know how to do it on your own you can actually file a trademark direct on your own and it's like a hundred bucks to file it online so for the cost of 700 bucks, Gene filed a trademark that, in my opinion, probably won't get, probably will not be awarded the trademark. But he got so much freaking press. And we're not talking about blabbermouth and brave words and three sides of the coin. coin. We're, we're, <laughs> we're talking major, major press. Like, The View was talking about him. <laughs> Was it Good Morning America or the Today Show was talking about him? Yes. Every radio station is talking about him. Really? Every, what does everybody say? is. Every, and, and they're all like up in arms that he can't do this, that you can't trademark that, that, oh, by the way, Ronnie James Dio's been doing this before you, and the Beatles were doing it before you, and, and everybody's trying to make a case of why he shouldn't be awarded it. You guys don't get it. He won. He won. Brilliant. He won he because w- you're talking about all of this every freaking day. And in the long shot, if they do give him this trademark, an even bigger win for him because nobody else th- thought about spending $700 to see if I could freaking trademark something. We should have done that. Maybe, maybe we should trademark that. Yeah. Oh, I know something else that was trademarked. <laughs> <laughs> A little inside joke. <laughs> um, but no, seriously, people, uh, he, he he won. He won the second he filed that trademark, and even if he doesn't get it, it you guys don't you don't you don't understand what he's doing. You don't understand press. You don't understand all good press. All press is good press. Love me or hate me, get out of the middle, get, spell my name, all of this stuff. That, that's what this is all about. And the fact that KISS fans are even freaking out that Gene would do something so low, slow, so without class. I'm like, do you understand this is Gene Simmons, right? Have you been a KISS fan for longer than, what, 24 hours? You know what he's like. This is him. This That's is the guy. I, this is the guy who talked about Prince's death, right? right. 
that's what always surprises me, though, is that you have all these fans who've been around the band forever, and he does something like this, and they're like, oh. it's like, come on, this is what he does. This is exactly what he, and that's why he does it to get you to go. Oh. <laughs> I, I, as soon as I saw that, the first thing I thought of was all my friends in England, and I always love that uh, that phrase they use of taking the piss out of something. That's exactly what he was doing. As soon as I saw that, I'm like, it's a total piss take. He knows he's going to get fucking tons of press for this, genuine or not. You you think he he you you think he's going to spend like tens of thousands of dollars if he gets. Uh, you know, if he doesn't get his way on this and he's going to fight to the death for this. No, no, he's <laughs> going to let it go. It's done. <laughs> I filed my trademark. I didn't get it. Exactly. You know what? I tell you what, I'm going to go and I'm going to go and ask money from every church because I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to do that. I'm I want praying hands now. I want a trademark. Oh, by the way, anybody hitchhiking? I'm now trademarking that. Guys, get, look at this! Uh, all this fucking material I'm giving you. I, I, well, how about how about Nikki Six? Nikki Six yeah. was like, "I'm going to trademark this." Yeah, that's where <laughs> I was going. That's uh, Mike ruins my bit. I was going to go through <laughs> all of them and end with that one. But but that's exactly what I was talking about. I'm like, guys, this is so. Si-. Again, it's one of those things. I turn on the internet and I'm like, uh, is someone actually like getting upset about this? I know. Don't please. Mark, Mark, God. if 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 Mark, let me ask you: If Gene did trade trademark that, how is that going to affect your day tomorrow? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Listen, every listener out there, every viewer out there, if Gene owns this trademark, how does your life change? You better not try to trademark this, though. Then we're going to have a problem. <laughs> I just I, I, this is no different than I want him I to see people arguing about stuff that is absolutely makes no sense in anyone's lives. And guys, if you're getting upset about stuff like that, I, move on, move on, <laughs> find a hobby. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it, I just I don't know. It's one of those just my jaws dropped. It's like, really? Really, you guys don't know what Gene Simmons is all about. It was great fun reading, though, and I and I loved how everyone was going back trying to find uh, any picture of Proof. that. And... Oh, this this oh. is the symbol for "I love you." This is this. It's like, who gives a crap? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know, like Paul Stanley's vocals. This is another case of we don't care, <laughs> and no, nor should you. I guess it's all funny. I, it's just fun to see somebody play the crowd the way Gene does. Oh, he's a master at it. Oh, it's, al- it's almost like he goes out and deliberately says something that stirs the pot, gets people pissed off, and then just sits back and lets it mm-hmm. blow up. Oh, I wonder somebody else, somebody we know that likes to do that, even when we let him in on the joke. Yeah. <laughs> It's almost as if I've studied Gene Simmons my entire frickin' life and pay attention to what he does. God. There's some Ace fan right now getting really pissed. Oh, I know. <laughs> they, don't know they, they, they don't know why, but they're just going to get pissed. Does it, right now, he doesn't even know why he's pissed. He's just pissed. Just wait, just hey, Ace fans. Just wait. Before this is over, I'll come up with a good reason for you to be pissed. Okay. All they have to do is hear your voice, Michael, and they get pissed. I, I think we're at that point now. They just need to see my name. He's a dick. He's a tool. I'm going to trademark Brandvold as a tool. There you go. Oh, absolutely. Hashtag Brandvold as a tool. Oh, I don't know. It's just this is what makes being a Kiss fan and having this show so much fun at times, and our Facebook page because we can just we can call well, you know, when they stop touring. This isn't going to stop. No, no. Gene's going to want even more attention when he's not touring anymore. You know, one one you of know, the things I I learned when through the years that I was working with Kiss, and this is actually smart. Gene slash Kiss would trademark a ton of stuff. 
a ton of phrases and names and you name it. Not necessarily because they planned on doing anything with it, but it's better to have the trademark in case you do something in the future. It's, you know, when you're something as big as KISS, a, a few hundred dollar investment to trademark something is really smart and cheap, even if you do nothing with it. You're not, you can own that trademark. You're not obligated to do squat with it. Well, and isn't it also a situation like it used to be when the internet first started and people were buying domain names? So if you trademark something that you're not going to use and all of a sudden someone comes along that's making a film that really needs that particular thing, they could literally reach out to Kiss sure, and purchase sure. that trademark. Yeah, so it could yeah. be also viewed as a business investment. It, it definitely it's, could be. It could be. So it's it's like, it's again, it's a very cheap, smart investment on Gene. Some of these he'll get lucky on, trademarking the money bag logo. That was a fucking gold mine that he stepped in. Maybe, like I said, in the long shot, they give him the trademark for this. I don't think so. But if they give it to him, fucking brilliant on his part to do something that Everybody else sat back and go uses every day, and now he will end up owning the trademark on it. That's not stupid of him. That's not low life. That's not having no class. That's actually being fucking brilliant and looking at an opportunity that the rest of the world passed by day after day after day. Well, and I'm sure his hopes of the whole thing is when you're standing in front of a band watching a concert and someone does this, they'll go, oh, Gene Simmons. No, the, no, his hope is that at a concert when somebody does this, like you were at Maiden, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So at that Maiden concert, the ushers will be at the end of every aisle passing the offering plate down, and you've got to drop a dollar in if you're going to hold up the metal horns at a Maiden concert. They take a photo of you, <laughs> tag you on Facebook, and he sends you a bill. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you, uh, you did the times at the Maiden show, and uh, uh, you owe me $10. You know, that's the whole silly thing, too, that people are getting all upset about. You know, so much of that is unenforceable. So much oh, of that is, is it's it's just, again, it's it's like as if you were to trademark the praying hands. Well, go to every church and stand outside and go, oh, I thought I saw you with your hands yeah. clasped together. Yeah. And, you know, come on. I, it, I, 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 see people, I, I do see where some people were genuinely going, you know, that's his ego. That's his, this, like Mike said. No, it's not. It's just being smarter than you. (laughs) That's all it is. And he's in a business where you want press. So think about it. If you're in his position, you can spend $700 and end up on major media outlets and all these other websites with someone talking about something you're doing. Who wouldn't spend that $700 all day long? Oh, and by the way, just so we can tie it into, because I've seen a couple people go, well, what's the point of press? He's got a solo tour he's promoting right now. He's he's announcing a whole bunch of solo shows. Solo shows. Yep. So, all tied so. together. Plus, guys, it's it, Mike. I I know you would agree wholeheartedly with this, just because you were around business wise at the time. Gene Simmons' family jewels sold Kiss tickets. It wasn't about Kiss, but Gene Simmons' family jewels TV show sold Kiss tickets. Because it was a popular show, Gene was the star, and you associate Gene with Kiss. And I do know for a fact that ticket sales were up when that show was popular. Like like he talks about all the time, the brand, the brand of Gene Simmons, the brand of Kiss. Mm-hmm. It makes a big, it, that's a big deal. And well, it's, it's brilliant on his part. Go ahead, Tom. Well, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just going to say, a couple of years ago when, when he was making different statements about suicide and, and all of that, and then Nikki Six jumped in, I don't doubt that Nikki is absolutely 100% authentic about his feelings regarding uh, you know, using and, and addiction and all that. But I wouldn't be surprised if he also jumped in a little bit to get some press on the tail end of all of that. Of course. Like, the thing I want people to, to realize is that in media – all this stuff is designed to get you to pay attention and listen. So there's never anything that's done as an accident anymore. Yeah, it wasn't an accident that somebody discovered that Gene Simmons trademarked this. It was a plan of, I'm going to trademark it, and he probably told one person. 
No, he probably one, spent half the one, day faxing everybody. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just like the one that he sends you every once in a while. Knock it off. <laughs> Mark, knock it off. I'm going to turn your router off again. Oh, well, so far, so good this morning. You know, by um, the way, one, this all right, is, uh, all right. So... so uh, so, so, so I was going to say, so that, that's our Gene Simmons rant. I just, it just dawned on me. We do need to get a little feedback from Mark about the New York Kiss Expo. Well, I wanted, to tie, I wanted to tie a few things in this morning. Um, I got a lot of email and saw a lot of comments about my Kiss Cruise rant. Well, the parts you could decipher, I should say. <laughs> Well, well, a f- funny thing happened along the way. Uh, obviously, everything I said at that at that after uh, whatever two Tuesday afternoons ago or whatever was spot on. It, it's exactly how I felt. Literally, fifteen minutes after we got done with the show, I got a call from a friend of mine who just asked me what I thought about the Kiss cruise coming up, and also let me uh, let me in on a on a rumor and everything and. And here's where it ties in with uh, with um, with the Kiss Expo. Um, Bruce Kulick was talking at the Kiss Expo about yep. what I yep. was told 15 minutes after um, after the show um, stopped uh, filming that he's supposed to partake in the Kiss Cruise. So Bruce was talking about it openly. So I'm not you know um, divulging things I shouldn't have. I shouldn't. Plus, I'm sure you guys all read about it on online by now, but that's going to be pretty exciting um, if that does happen. And from what I understand, it is. Um, you know, Bruce is talking about. He seemed very excited about it. I think it's very exciting as a Kiss fan um, that that's that he's going to be on the cruise. Um, I also talked to some of the guests that were on or that were at the New York Kiss Expo. And there's rumors, too, that uh, there's going to be some pretty cool special guests. And I think um, by the time you this airs, maybe it'll be official. I don't know. But right now, as it stands, um, both, both Bruce Kulick and some of the special uh, guests that were at the New York Expo were all saying that they're going to be part of the KISS cruise. And that's part of the reason that it's the KISS world at sea. So um, my, your humble correspondent here wants to apologize to a degree for my rant because I didn't know that stuff. Um, if is the, if all those rumors are true, that's going to be pretty fucking kick ass. I think that stuff trumps the whoever the other musical acts are because I'm going I'm to the Kiss Cruise for one ru- one reason and one reason only. I want as much Kiss as possible. But I also look at the Kiss Cruise much like a Kiss tour. You know, Kiss never, for the most part, ever let us down with opening acts. They always made sure the opening acts were good. You don't think so? <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh-uh. Okay, let's go through the list. Vandenberg. I like Vandenberg. I like Heaven. Keep going. Uh, so far, you're zero for zero for me. No, I mean, two for just, two. I uh, would agree I mean, with Mark. Both those, both those records are dynamite. Next. Ugh, yuck. No, they they have a history of having the worst opening acts. No, oh, I, oh, I, I will say oh, that that like that DC, DC? <laughs> and, and Iron Maiden. Iron Maiden. See Iron Maiden. I didn't see ACDC. I didn't see Scorpions. I'm talking I'm about. Just saying, they have a his a very rich history. Well, yeah, from around. Two through God knows when it was like. Then they finally got Buck Cherry on for the reunion. I'm like, this is awesome. Obviously, there's there's going to be a chunk that I didn't like, but at the same time, overall, they helped launch more than a few careers. Career. I'm not Judas arguing Priest. that. Judas Priest. <laughs> yeah, that- come on. So, anyways, let let me go through my my little thing here with that. I was upset because I didn't think they put much thought into it and for whatever you know if even if you wanted to use those bands vandenberg who was hot at the time that was a, they had a big song on mtv at the time just because you didn't like it didn't mean they didn't have a hot video at the time there's a huge difference we know that tommy's taste in music sucks 
It was in a hot video. But they didn't bring, you know, you know, at the time, they didn't bring a Beatles tribute band out with them on the Lick It Up tour. They didn't bring, didn't bring a, a... I would have preferred that. ...out on tour with them on the Animal Eyes tour. But that's my point. You know, if you look back in their history, they always tried to... Even bands that I didn't like at the time, Trickster, never into that stuff. But they were they were on MTV at the time when they brought, they brought you it. You love Trickster. You know, you know, they, they, they paid attention. I didn't Gene, Gene's cutting you off again, Mark. All right. How's this better? Better. Slow down. Don't speak so fast. <clears throat> when they were bringing bands like Trickster on, on the Hot in the Shade tour, they had their ear to the ground. They were trying to bring bands on or Faster Pussycat, who I actually love. But they tried to bring bands that were current. Um, You know, fast forward to now, that's how come I felt so... You know, number one, there is no MTV or anything like that now. There's there's barely even a scene for hard rock. I mean, you really have to go look for it. It doesn't fall in your lap like it used to. But, you know, now when I look at it on the whole, that's what the KISS world at sea. If Bruce is going to be on there, if these other people are going to be on there, now we're talking. That's good. That, that to me, trumps having... The, the, the other things. And maybe, maybe, and this is just my speculation, maybe that's why, you know, they're having bands they don't have to pay as much to is because they're bringing all this other stuff on. I don't know. All I know is, like I said, too, because if, if you go back and, and, you know, being honest with myself and being honest with you guys, I did say at my last rant, look, I'm still going to have a great time. I'm still going to have fun. That's all true. But I think, I think if, this kiss world thing is as, as it's supposed to be. I think it's going to be uh, fantastic. So well, hey, I, hey, I, you know what? I made me. my rant prior to knowing uh, some details, which were huge details. So, right. Pretty- but I, just, I thought it was interesting how so many people got so upset with your rant in general. And we've always said this since the beginning. We are going to tell you the truth. We're going to tell you how we feel about things. And we don't just shill for the band because there was a perfect example. Mark was like fired up, you know, and he told you what he thought of it. He was unhappy. Now he's happy. Well, I, I look, like you just said, go back. I just admitted I was wrong because I didn't have all the details. But I will tell you, they should have given us the details first. Because you couldn't possibly be happy with that if you're a Kiss fan. I at least a pain. And and I don't take if you're not going on the cruise, I don't think your mat your opinion matters so much on that because you're not paying for it. You can you can look at it passively and go, oh well, this is stupid, I'm not going. Whatever. But if you've already paid, I, I've already paid, and thousands of other people have already paid. If you already paid and then you got that, knowing the history of the cruise. Because we've had some dynamite entertainment in the last five years, six years. I, you know, it's it's hard not to feel let down when you just see something so uninspired. So I wish they would have waited on the, uh, you know, on the information. So, but that's well, that's my two. Mark, Mark, why don't you use that as a segue and give us a little little bit of feedback on the New York Expo because there was a lot of chatter online about. Um, what people thought of the expo. Tommy and I didn't go. You went out there, not not as three sides of the coin. You just went out there as a fan. Yeah, I, look, even right. even when I go on the cruise and stuff, I'm not going out as Mark from three sides of the coin. I'm going as Mark Chikini Kiss fan. So, um, look, I'll give you a little like a little little background. Liz and I went. Um, we didn't go to the Friday night thing, um, and everyone I talked to. Put it this way. I talk to a lot of people saying everyone's unfair. Everyone I talk to for the Friday night, it was supposed to be like a meet and greet with Peter and all that sort of stuff. I talked to, let's just say I talked to a good portion of the people because I had quite a few friends that went. Everyone had a different story. The people who got in thought it was great. The people who didn't get in had to go early the next morning. So keep in mind, the people who didn't get in had to wait there three and four hours and had to, were told to come back the next morning. How would you feel if you paid for that experience? I'm pissed and I didn't even go. <clears throat> yeah, I, look, but the people who did get in 
said it was fucking greatest thing ever. Said Peter was in good spirits. They also said that he looked tired. And I even had one or two friends say that he mentioned to them how he just he wasn't feeling. Again, this is what people told me to my face. Whatever. But one of the things that I is 100% verifiable is that people waited. Some folks waited, you know, three and four hours on Friday night for something they paid to go to and were told to come back the next morning early to be the first in line to get their experience. Look, <laughs> I don't think any of the three of us have to go into that. And that isn't that isn't on the promoter. If the guest says they can't go anymore till people are done, and forget the fact that, you know, Eric's my friend and I've known him for years and, and stuff. You two, and the reason I brought Eric up is because you guys witnessed him in New Jersey last year. He just powered through it, man. So everyone's well, everyone's a fucking machine. It's unbelievable. So so my my point is, and I understand he's there's probably a twenty year age difference or whatever. But you know what? You sign the dotted line to to be there on a on a Friday night to take care of the people who all paid. And I don't care if it's Gene, Eric, Tommy, or Alice Cooper, or Robert Plant, or whoever. If you're getting paid in a Friday night in advance to give a fan 10 minutes and an autograph, guess what? You're under ob obligation whether you feel good or not. That's my opinion. Because I'm a contractor. And when people, when I tell somebody I'm going to be somewhere and do some cement at their house or in their business, and I'm going to be there at 10 o'clock and I'm not staying until it's over, that's on me. It's no different with, with Peter Chris or any other celebrity. You took their money. You told them where, the, where to be. They were on time. Get your fucking pen and sign. That's it. And, and if you don't feel good, too fucking bad. Take a picture with them. Let them go. I've, I've seen other celebrities do it. I've seen Kiss do it. I've been close enough to them a few times where I saw that Gene wasn't feeling good or Paul wasn't feeling good, but they did it anyway. And there's a difference. There's a fucking difference. So that happened Friday night. Uh, Saturday, Liz and I didn't want to get down there too early because I know how that when you when they open the doors at an expo, sometimes it's a clusterfuck. And from what I hear, this one was no different. So Liz and I went, you know, we waited. I think the doors opened at 10 or 1030. We, we purpose, purposefully didn't get there till whatever, 1130 noon. I wanted to. Boy, oh, boy. Um <clears throat> Number one, it was uh, at the very top floor of, uh, of a hotel. And I think it was eight, see, I think it was the 18th floor. Up there, was, the air was kind of heavy and thick. Just, you know, it was tell the air conditioning didn't work too well. Again, you're in an older building. You're on the top floor. Heat rises, you know. And there was a lot of people who was very well attended, very well attended. I saw our former guest, Mr. Christopher. Um, he was overwhelmed. Um, he was at the desk trying to figure things out and I didn't want to bother to say anything. So I walked in and I saw a lot of the, there was, there was not very many dealers and of the, I don't know, six to 10 dealers there were, I knew probably half, some old friends of mine from way back in the, the dealer days, guys who I'm actually really, really good friends with. So, you know, we sat with them and talked with them, but what I thought was odd was the layout of the room. If you take the room, I don't know how I'd put it like this. If my fingers are the stage, um, in between where my thumbs would be, there were all the seats. But the seats went up to the <laughs> to the tables, which are represented by my thumbs, that you only had maybe, and I'm not exaggerating, three feet maybe between the end of the seats oh, and wow. the, which deal wow. tables were. Now, to make matters worse, that whole area was the line if you – Think of it as, uh, you know, half of a of a of a square. That's where the line for Peter Chris was. So you, if you wanted to go look at dealer tables, you literally had to bump into people because you had about three feet between the person standing in line for Peter Chris and to look at the dealer tables. And I'm like, you got to be effing kidding me. And the dealers are going, people can't come to the dealer tables because of the line. And on top of that, it, it, you know, your table was against the wall. You, you, had, you know, you, you're just pushed up against the wall. There's no room. 
And to make matters worse for the dealers and, and for the people too, but more so for the dealers because they couldn't leave their tables. The only food and drink available was either on the first floor or outside. So my my beautiful, lovely wife went for a couple of the dealers who are friends of mine, and ours, and Liz loves them too, um, and went and got food and drink for them. You know, uh, it's just bad, man. Um, so that was that was a bit of a bone of a contention. I had a ton of, and I can't remember everybody's names, but if you came up to me, I know your face. I just, there's so many people, it's hard with the name thing. A lot of three sides love. I, a lot of people come up to me. I had a few people, more than a few actually, take asked to get their picture taken. And I always say, you know, send it to Mike. And I think you posted a couple of the photos. But I, I, I bet you I had a half a dozen people say, go up on stage and talk about three sides or do something. They had a stage, but no PA or no working PA. I, I, had, I had heard somebody, yeah, somebody said there was no working PA and that the sound guy quit or walked out like the, the morning of or the day of something yeah, like well, that. There's a reason I'm being really cautious with my words because I read that too, Michael, and I heard that there, but I can't confirm that. You know what I mean? So if I, and, and, I don't and, know. And just so everybody knows, you know, Mark mentioned Derek Christopher who put on the New York Expo. He was on here in the past for the LA Expo. We've reached out to him to come on the show and see if he wants to talk about what happened i mean I, I know from our past conversations with him he's been very upfront about stuff look, so look, we'll let we'll you know fingers crossed well, Derek will well, be on derek, in a few weeks yeah derek told us in no uncertain certain terms he wants to do more conventions and he wants to come on and, and get the truth out and and that's what he's going to do so that's another reason i'm being cautious with my words i want you guys to look forward to when derek comes on because to everybody who's read stuff about this expo don't know the whole truth and i know that because we talked to Derek. yeah there are yeah. a lot of things a lot of actually some pretty big bombshell things that you guys don't know that you're going to find out uh here on three sides of the coin when we have uh Derek back on so he'll probably be on i'm guessing in the next few weeks it's going to be an incredible show because number one he's a good guy uh he has you know, a great heart tommy big I, heart tommy and i were in la he treated us like kings and he didn't even have <laughs> Derek's a very nice guy. Yeah, Derek's a great guy. So anyways, um, moving forward from there, like Michael just said, you know, the, the PA, for, for whatever reason, wasn't operable. There were people that were supposed to do, um, you know, talk. That's how come people ask them, like, could you go up there? I mean, because there was no entertainment. There was no music being blasted and nothing. And these people weren't joking. They were serious. Like, could you go up there and maybe tell some kiss stories or something? there's, we have nothing to, to, to look or talk about, you know? So I'm like, I can't do that. Well, cause one guy said to me, he's like, well, you know, the promoter, just go up there and start talking about three sides or kiss, like do a one man show. Or something. I'm like, I start, we start <laughs> do a one man show. <laughs> and I'm like, no, I, I Mark, can't just go up there and eat some meatloaf. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so well, it was funny too. Cause Liz is sitting behind Joe Marshall's table <laughs> and some guys just, Long and he's like, "Are you the meatloaf lady?" <laughs> <laughs> the meat, the lady. meatloaf lady. Nice. That's a T-shirt. We got to do a T-shirt. The meatloaf, meatloaf. lady. So, so it was funny. So, anyways, um, I know that uh, I think it was Carol Ross was supposed to be on. Um, I heard she just left. She was supposed to be on at like noon or one o'clock or something. I don't think the first guest got on till I think like four or five, and they were supposed to start I think at ten or eleven. You yeah, know, right it, when, it, it I, when I saw pictures, it looked like all of the special guests got up there at the same time, like Big John Hart, Chris Lent, Robert Conti, uh, Dennis Wallach, Ken Kelly. I saw them all on stage together. I thought they were supposed to go up separately. They were an hour. That's how come somebody said to me, "If by now it was ever one o'clock." You know, they'd been there since 10, these people. And how nice would it have been if every hour somebody went up there and gave them a half an hour? You know, Robert Conti. And that's another thing. I tell you what, uh, I, I, Michael and Tommy and, and everybody out there in Three Sides Land, all, you know, Dennis Wallach and, and, and Big John Hart and Chris Lund, all friends of the show, um, Conti, all of them. Man, I tell you what, 
the the love we got from those guys and our love back was so cool. I sat and talked to Robert for a while, talked to Big John, talked to Chris Lent for a while. I even asked Chris Lent to, you know, because uh, if you read his book, which is probably one of the best Kiss books out there. Yeah, it's amazing. Right, right it's so, he, he's, he's kind of a foodie, and that's a little funny term for someone who likes to go to restaurants, and that's certainly what Liz and I like to do. So, you know, we're in Midtown Manhattan. Really? I, I asked really? him. Yes. So, um, you know, I was just, you know, here, here's, here's, what here's, what's plan, plan. for the guys this guy, I, clubs. There's this guy. And here, here, here we are sitting, talking, you know, restaurants in, in Manhattan. So it was just really great catching up with him and, uh, and same with Dennis Wallach, you know, talk to him. It was just so cool. You know what I mean? So, how great would it have been for each one of those guys to be up there for half an hour? An hour yes, they should have. Yeah, because then people that, can that, ask questions. Yes, people well, would have liked it a lot more. So anyway, so Liz and I stayed there for a bit. And then uh, we left for a couple hours and came back because we were just saying our goodbyes because we weren't staying there, you know, late. Now, I was telling you, the people who were in front of my friend um, Joe's table... Now, we, Liz and I had been gone now for a couple of hours. When we came back, they were only about halfway through the room. Oh, wow. So when I talked to a few people that did this, some of them were waiting. Tommy, this is the same thing that happened in L.A. Four hours in line. In line. That's just, see, and I don't understand. That's, that's, treating, that's not treating your fans well. Well, I, I don't understand why they can't do it in 25 25- increments like the one through 25 get lined up and then as you're like at maybe number 20 then say okay everyone who's got a ticket from 26 to 50 come and get in line now so people it's can like a safe convention. yeah, yeah it's like it's it's like getting on an airplane in zones there's yeah. a reason to do that so it's not just this you know huge bum rush and not everybody has to stand in line so did you go hang out with Gigi at all when you were there <laughs> Oh, you look at the time. <laughs> we'll address that. We'll address that. Uh, in a few Do you have a episode. pocket full of ones? <laughs> Boy, is it sunny out. <laughs> God, that just doesn't get old. Oh, oh my God. Those of, you, those of you who get that, they congratulate. It's, it, trust me. Maybe in a way we can address that somewhere down there. Yeah. If you if you know, <laughs> you're you're rolling in laughter right now. Yeah. You're so, going. Did they just say that? Yeah. yeah. Oh my god. So when? So, and we leave. And I I just That's talked to a few of my friends later on that night who went. And, and to be to be fair. Um, Everyone that I, I talked to, and it's quite a few, at least a couple dozen, they said Peter was great. Um, signed their stuff, took photos, was in a good mood. So, you know, I guess if you made it through the maelstrom, it was okay. I mean, you had a good time. But wait a second. Wait, wait. Isn't this interesting, though? Whenever we talk about Peter, not any of the other guys, but whenever we talk about Peter, we're always saying, oh, it sounds like he was or he was in good spirits. Like there's some volatility there that you just don't know for sure. Well, you know, one of the reasons that I, I even when we were in L.A., the stuff that I went and got signed, I got I was in line with Tommy and another friend just because they needed something signed. I I wasn't going to get anything signed. Well, yeah. who, who was the guy that was standing by us when we were in line that day? He was kind of directing stuff. He was really nice. Remember when well, we were I, up the stairs? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I know what you're t- I, I don't remember, but I guess the point is this. There's a reason in all my kissdom and all my fan craziness and collectors and that I do. There's a reason over time that I didn't do for Peter what I probably would have done and have done. You know, with Kiss in the past, I've met Peter over a dozen or so times. And I'm just giving you my personal experience. And I'm, I'm talking, this goes back t- from to the 80s till now. Peter Chris is a, is, 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 a, is a weird study because sometimes when I've met him, he's been great. And sometimes when I've met him, he's been a real jerk. And you don't know what you're going to get. 
Now, by the time Peter did what he did in, in, in L.A. back in January when Tommy and I went, I didn't know what Peter I was going to get. And I certainly wasn't going to risk, risk a couple hundred dollars. I wasn't going to res- you know, risk a couple hundred dollars to get it. I've already had my picture taken with him in makeup and without makeup. I've got his autograph dozens of times. So there was no incentive for me to do that. Um, so I, w- I guess I'm a bit of an anomaly. I-, I-, I know that a lot of fans who just did this all said that I think most of them, if not all. When am I going to get another chance to meet? So they were willing to risk a few dollars to do. I wasn't, and, I, and, I, and I'm lucky you know, enough with my past experience. But I think Tommy, that answers your question because I'm not alone. I've talked to enough people. Who no, I know you're not. That's why I wanted to bring it up because I just it's of all of the musicians, that's the he gets that tag sometimes like you're not sure who's going to well, show up well, I, just think I think it's that's just you know if, if you've been a kiss fan long enough and you've read all of the books and listen to people who met him he's the guy who's got a personality that mark described exactly it's on or off sometimes he can be the warmest most friendly family type guy and the other times that personality is completely turned off and it's like jesus Go jump off a bridge, Peter. Yeah, I, that's, there's no guys, in, that's, there's there's like no in between. It's either one or the other extreme. Yeah, and that again that that's why um, I'm trying to tell this the whole story. And then the next day, um, I would have loved to have gone on that bus thing. That was the that was the uh, the Sunday thing. But you know, I I, I got to get home. I got business and family and everything so i would have liked to have done that that looked fun i would rather have done the new york one than the la one just for obvious reasons there's a lot more landmarks they they, you know peter took them to and inside electric ladyland studios yeah so again guys like we say all the time on the show one thing you're going to get from the three of us is the fucking truth every single time and, you know, everything I just talked about for Friday and Saturday, I talked to numerous people who went on the, the bus thing. And But keep in mind, too, there was also a big problem with the bus thing. This goes back into the whole Peter experience. There always seems to be someone getting shafted. Whether, and what I mean that by that is people who don't get into the meet and greet, who paid. People who got in line and had to wait for it five hours. People who are supposed to get on a fucking bus who paid and couldn't get on. So, guys, again, I'm not willing to risk my money or my time on something like that. That's all. I think that's a fair thing to say, too, because it's, it's 100% accurate. Now, moving forward, the folks that who went on that, every person I talked to on a man who, who ended up on the bus had a great time. Or I should say at a good time. I, I did talk to two people. I guess there was a double-decker bus, and uh, I talked to a friend of mine who was in the bottom. He kind of felt... No. So, so what I, I I heard that. So initially, and and Derek said he would love to come on and address what happened with the bus tour as well. But it was a double decker tourist bus, like you would normally see, the open deck up top, closed below. And from my understanding, when the tour started, Peter was up top, fans are up top. There were fans down below. And they would listen to Peter through earbuds. And they were not happy that Peter's up there and they're only listening through earbuds. But as the tour went on, it got hot upstairs. Peter then came down and was doing his speaking to the people who were downstairs. So then the people up top were listening through the earbuds. So, yeah. But but anyway, so that so I would have liked to have gone that. By and large, I think Sunday was it was a big success. Uh, I had a couple of my friends who thought it was a near religious ex- experience. They had so much fun. They say, I saw a video. They sang Beth that, with Peter Chris in front of Madison Square Garden. Yes, yes, and 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 guys, that's incredible. That's great stuff. I think that's awesome. And, and if you guys remember too, in L.A., they sang Beth on the bus too, and. I can't say enough good things about that because that's all I heard for the most part on, on the Sunday was, was good things. Now, 
fast forward to what happened last night was Peter's last show. I was lucky enough to talk to a friend of mine on the phone this morning who was there. And again, rave reviews. Peter sounded great. Um, you know, all that stuff. But as a Kiss fan, Pete, where have you been the last 15 years? The last time I saw Peter Chris on tour solo wise was in Detroit in 1994. Where have you been, man, for 20 some some years? Well, and, and and we can talk a little bit about it, but before we get into it, I just want to read the set list because we did this for when he did this in Australia and we talked a bit about how the set list was a little bit of a really, you know, where's certain songs. So here's the set and the set list in New York was different, not dramatically different, but different. So here's 13 songs that Peter played. Um, in order, he did I Can't Stop the Rain, Hooked on Rock and Roll, Strange Ways, Strutter, You Matter to Me, Don't Let Me Down, Hooligan, Nothing to Lose, Words, Hard Luck Woman, Beth, Rock and Roll All Night, and then Sing, Sing, Sing. That set list feels better to me than what he did in Australia. I'm glad you feel that way. That's exactly what I thought too, Michael. And from what I talked to my friend this morning, you said the same thing. You thought the set list was dynamite. You said Peter played great. And and I tell you a big shout out. And I, I didn't talk to them um, that much, but I did say hi. Oh, your jeans, oh. Gene, you know, you're starting to talk about Peter again and Gene's cutting you out. How about now? There better? we go. Uh, the Sister Doll guys were at the expo and uh, just seemed like a good good bunch of guys. So just a shout out to them. They were next to Big John and uh, just said hi to them. And uh, again, everything I, I heard about both the Australian show and the New York show, they played great. And, uh, you know, uh, it was a good show. I would have loved to have seen that last night. But Jesus Christ, Peter, how come you didn't tour that? Well, you should have been well, doing clubs. Yeah. I mean, for the last 20 years. You know, so this this is where, this is just my two cents on this whole thing. And I asked somebody who went to last night's event, I go, do you really believe this is Peter's last performance in the U.S.? My take is, I don't believe it for a second. I, you know, if if Kiss offers Peter a boatload of money to play one more show or a weekend worth of shows or a New York show and an LA show to end the kiss performance with Gene and Paul. You don't think for a second, Peter would do it. I do. Oh, you know, I think he'd do it in a heartbeat. I do too. By the way, before we get all kinds of crazy mail, we're going to do, I do realize that from 96 to 2003, I don't, I do know that Peter did play in Kiss. So when I say the last 20 years, what I mean by that is from the time you left Kiss until the time, till, you know, till this time, right. he, he right. could have, he had easy 20 plus years from the early eighties to now that he didn't tour or he toured sparingly or, you know what I mean? I think, I don't know why he didn't, even if he would have played the smallest of clubs. And there's no shame in that. No. He could have went around and kept, he, he actually could have sold some more product. You know what I mean? He could have moved his CDs more had he went out and toured. He, again, even at a small club level. And guess what? Had he done that, he may have got on even as a third bill on a major tour. But had he kept that up. His career is just... I hate to say it, it's one of laziness. Well, you know, you, you know, I don't even if he didn't want to undertake the ordeal of a tour. And I can get that. You know, why? Cuz he's not going to be flying in a Learjet. He's not, you know, in a big tour bus. If he were to tour now, it's down and dirty cuz Peter Chris is not drawing big money. But saying that, he could have easily done, look, you know, he played the cutting room in New York City. He could have sat here and said, you know what, I'm going to do like like what Paul does with the Soul Station. I'm going to do some spot shows every once in a while. I'll do a show in New York. 
I'll do a one-off show at the Roxy in L.A. I'll do some show at the House of Blues in Chicago. I'll go down to New Orleans and do a show. Not a tour, just special shows. There's no reason he couldn't have done a bunch of special shows here and there with this type of set list, doing it his way. Mike, Mike, I'll give you a great example. I think because I was bummed I missed it. I think a couple nights, Friday night, a couple nights ago here in Detroit, we, we have a place called the Magic Bag, which is a cool little, cool little club. Only homes that holds a few hundred people. Rick Emmett from Triumph was there. Oh, wow. I'm a big Triumph wow. fan. But Peter could have played that circuit. You know what I mean? These little places that hold a few hundred people, even if it didn't sell out. You know, I've seen other bands. Should have seen the Super Suckers there. But they always made sure they brought CDs with them and T-shirts and, and stuff like that. And it was great. You know, speaking of the Super Suckers, I'm a huge fan of theirs. And I loved what uh, Eddie Spaghetti got up and he says, because matter of fact, they just played at Smalls here a couple of months ago. It's another local club. He's like, everywhere we go, we always run into about 500 of the greatest rock and roll fans in the world. Every town we go. So in other words, yeah, we're not playing your local arena. But for the 500 people or two to 500, whoever shows up, you're the greatest rock fans in the world. Because there are many bands like that. Uh, bands like we've mentioned recently, Biters and uh, and uh, bands like the Struts that are still playing. They're playing little places that only hold a couple hundred people. But that's how you, you know, you make a career. And, and Peter Chris still to this day could play to a couple hundred people if he wound up in Chicago or Detroit or Minneapolis or he could have and he didn't and as a Kiss fan I feel cheated that way because I would have loved to have thought more of Peter Chris the artist than just Peter Chris the guy who was in Kiss had he presented himself as Peter Chris the artist if he would have went out and toured his records and and made himself part of something he always seemed to rest on his laurels. And that's one thing you can't say about Ace in a lot of ways. He did put out records. He did tour. He kept trying. He kept doing yeah. it. Yeah. And, and again, look, I, I, saw, I saw Ace in the places that only held a couple hundred people. There's no shame in that. Because he's a fucking, he's an artist. He's a musician. He went out there. And you know what? He got his money and he kept going, you know? There's no shame in it. I, again, you look at someone like Rick Emmett. I mean, they had... They had big records in the 80s. They were a very popular band. They played Kobo on their own They played the Us Festival. Yeah, I guess that's my point. You know, you, you get the respect that, you know, that you deserve because you work for it. And I think Peter was lazy. Well, I'm talking in the grand scheme. In the grand scheme, he was lazy. Well, back, back, know, back to my original question, though, to you, you two guys. Do you honestly think this is the last time Peter's going to perform live in the U.S.? Hell no. Tom. He's going to be something, something. I don't know. It all depends if GG lets him. <laughs> Grow some balls, Tommy. It's a yes or no question. <laughs> Being like Mark today. No, I don't no, know. No, Mark I, answered the question. Yeah. yeah. I have no idea. I, I don't know. I'm sure that if, if Kiss came to him and offered him a chunk of money, he'd put the grease paint back on for one or two last shows. But I don't think that that's the way it was billed. It was more billed as a Peter Chris solo thing. No, it was billed as Peter's last performance in the U.S. Well, maybe he knows that Kiss won't call. I don't know. I mean, I'm... I mean, okay. So even if Kiss doesn't call, if a promoter in Los Angeles said, you know, what you did in New York is pretty fucking cool. You got a lot of fans on the West Coast. We'd like to do a performance for you at the Roxy in L.A. In L.A. He'd be there. Okay, there you go. You just answered the question. So New York was not his last performance. There, there, I, there will be. I just think there will be. And, and listen, this isn't a dig at Peter. This is a dig at every freaking band who says it's the farewell tour. Didn't the Who retire in 82? It was their farewell tour. Yeah, and, to and, and the Scorpions <laughs> have retired, and Judas Priest has retired, and Kiss, and Ozzy. Um, you know, I'm I'm putting all my I'm putting money on the fact that Motley Crue will eventually be back. So I, you know, oh, that you know. would be awesome. No way. You really think so? Of course. Of course. 
Money talks, people. Money talks. I can tell you from when, when, when I was working at the merchandising company, how many reunion tours happened because of divorces, separations, and bankruptcies. Yep. That we need to get the band together because I got to pay some alimony to somebody. Sammy Hagar. <laughs> That's what all the unboxed was about. Please. When money steps up to the table... Whatever you said in the past is completely forgotten. The only way it will never happen, and, and I don't want it to sound brutal like this, is when they are dead. That is the, that only, is that the, is the only, only guarantee that a band, a performer, will never play again. That's it. They physically can't do it. Well, I hope you're right in that Motley Crue gets back together. That would be awesome. We'll see. So, we have We're a special stressed, guest okay. this week. <laughs> we have uh, an author. Sometimes authors don't turn out very well on this show. Other times, like this week, they turn out freaking amazing. And amazing. They do when you have an actual book. A good book. And an actual book. book. Oh, God. Why is it when you point out that a book isn't coming out, and then they get mad at you when you pointed it out and a couple and years it, by and it never comes no one out? Says that you, no one says you guys were spot on. Yeah. on or <laughs> I look on Amazon every month. Yeah, yeah. Great, great. And that's that's no dig at any anyone in particular. But when we point out things because we are in the know, people call you no, assholes. We are we are dicks. We are tools. Yeah. We are yeah, assholes. We just pointed out the obvious. <laughs> you hate this. You hate no one. No, we're just telling you the truth because it's what we do. Anyway, th- th- this this author, uh, Larry Harris. Awesome. I hope you guys know that name. If you don't, Google the name Larry Harris in reference to Kiss. Get a little background. He's the author of the book and Party Every Day: The Inside Story of Casablanca Records. A must-have book. And and for me, it was a must-have book because it wasn't only about Kiss. It was about Casablanca Records and all of the ongoings with inside Casablanca. Larry Harris was I, I, there from day one at Cas. He is related to Neil Bogart. Michael and Tommy, before we go on with this, though, there are a few things, dear viewer and listener, there are a few things that... Larry glosses over factual wise. And he's one of those guys, much like when Paul Stanley has done this stuff, he lived it. He was going so fast living it that sometimes uh, 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 one of the things that stands out is when he talks about live being just recorded at Kobo. Right. When, when right. we get past those little, because there's a few things where I think some of the fans of this show, and I mean this in a, in a wonderful way, you guys know every bit of my, my minutia. Sometimes when you, especially when you have a guest on like Larry, who is in the fast lane, living this as fast as the band, this is the way they remember stuff. Whereas you can go back and go, oh, no, well, Wildwood was recorded. And this, just. This, 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 this isn't about nitpicking the fine details. Right. This is about talking to somebody who was there before Kiss. Yes. He was there when Kiss auditioned, showcased for the label. He was there. He saw it. He lived it. He experienced it. That is just amazing that somebody can share their stories. Now, the book covers it. We have them on for, I don't know, about an hour or so. It was a killer discussion with Larry. Can't wait to have him back. He's another the one of those. We need another part two and possibly part three. I yeah, mean, I uh, mean, there was so much. You know, he was there from seventy four to eighty. A ton of stuff happened in history, and we tried to touch on a lot of little things. But we could have done a whole show just about the solo albums and what he thought and in, in detail on the solo album. Destroyer, Alive. We could have talked about one album for hours if we wanted to with him. 
So, yeah. so and Mark scored the collectible, so you guys are already too late. Oh, did you get it? Well, uh, let's just say we're uh, all right. To be fair, because by the time this airs, um, Larry found some more stuff. So we're looking at a package deal. Whoa! <laughs> are you going to share it with us when it when you get it? Of course not. <laughs> ah, you <laughs> bastard! I know. I I promised to share some of it. He, we're working on something pretty fucking cool. Okay. Good. Well, there you go. Yeah. Oh, look, man, I'm 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 stoked. Let it roll, Larry Harris. We'll catch you when this is over. So you love the show. Go to itunes.threesidesofthecoin.com and leave your review and rating of Three Sides of the Coin. Thanks. Hey everybody, so I want to welcome a really special guest to Three Sides of the Coin this week. Um, I am I am proud to welcome Larry Harris to the show. And uh, yes, applause. If, if, as a diehard KISS fan, you should be very aware of Larry's name and what he's done in the history world. But for for those youngins that are out there, and, and Larry, we definitely have some youngin KISS fans out there that are listening to us. Let me just give them a quick little up, I mean like two sentences here. And if you care to elaborate on it, you can. Um, Larry Harris began working for Buddha. Kama Sutra Records in the summer of 1971 as the local New York promotions man. And in 1973, you joined your cousin, Neil Bogart. Everybody better know that name. Neil Bogart in founding Casablanca Records. He went on to become the senior vice president and managing director of the company in 1976 and left Casablanca in the fall of 1980. So, you have a lot of history going way back to the very beginning, the Plymouth Rock moment, you could say, of, of KISS. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Uh, I was there in the very beginning. Yeah. Even right after Wicked Lester passed away. Yeah. Passed away. <laughs> What what I mean? What was you know? We've 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 read the stories in the books, and we've heard Gene and Paul's version of things, and and I think what we're more interested in is is your, I don't know, your memories, your feelings. What do you remember back in 1973 when when this band came across the desks at Casablanca Records? I mean, and and. What 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 was what was the first reaction? Well, it didn't it, it well it didn't come across the desk. Casablanca didn't exist uh, at that moment in time. Um, what it was is Neil Bogart was having uh, an affair with a video director named Joyce Biowitz, and Joyce's partner was a guy named Bill Coin, and they did a lot of videos. They shot some for us for various artists, but they also had a a TV show on, you know, it wasn't a real TV channel. I think it was one of those UHF channels. Right. <laughs> um, and uh, they would interview artists and stuff like that. But the artist I remember the most I'm interviewing for some reason is Sha Na Na, who was on Buddha Records, um, one of my favorite bands. Um, but um, Neil came in to me one day, at, well, I was still at Buddha, and so was he, and said, uh, want you to see this band tonight and um joyce is managing them and so is bill coin who i knew just from the video stuff and uh, so we went to a little tiny studio to see this band actually walking into the studio there were tons of i haven't seen so many video cameras um before and uh i was about to learn that this band was practicing in front of video cameras which in those days nobody did because uh, nobody had video cameras, but Bill and Joyce, of course, did because that was their business. And uh, so I, Neil and I went to see the band. We I talk about it in the book where we stopped by Tad's Steakhouse, which is like the worst steaks you could possibly have for like two dollars or something. And um, Neil inhaled his food, which he always did. And I like you know, had a few bites, and then we ran out to go to see the band. And it was just me, Neil, Buck Reingold, who also worked at Buddha, um, 
and with his brother-in-law, as we like to say at Casablanca and Buddha, everything is relative. And um, so we saw these guys go up on stage. They didn't have the full makeup. They didn't have the drum kit. I mean, it was a small drum kit. They didn't have the Kiss logos anywhere. And it was a really small stage. I, I don't think the guys were more than a foot or two away from each other. And uh, by the time it was over, um, my ears hurt so bad I wasn't prepared for the loudness. I, uh, after that, I learned whenever I went to see Kiss, I would stuff cigarette butts in my ears so I wouldn't kill myself. <laughs> but um, they blew us away. I mean, just we hadn't ever seen anything like that before. And to be honest with you, it was so loud and everything. I, I really didn't pay attention to the lyrics. It was all the show, uh, which there were no fire and there was no there was no special effects at all. It was just raw kiss. Uh, and um, Neil had made up his mind even before we saw them that if I liked them, because I was in charge of album promotion at Buddha, which I would be at Casablanca as well. And he knew when we weren't going to get immediate top 40 airplay on this band which is what sold most records in those days. Uh, we would need the progressive rock stations to jump on board. But if I liked it, we were going to sign them, and we signed them uh, to be eventually part of Casablanca. And that was my first introduction to them. And and did now you said they didn't really have the makeup. They didn't have even their very early... They had, a little, they had a little makeup, and they had the high boots. And some leather stuff. Did did you know at that time but, what their intentions were to do? Or did they not, not even know their intentions? You know, I don't think they did because we... After we left Casablanca... Uh, Casablanca. After we left Buddha, we Neil would take them around to magic shops and, and um, places that had various kinds of clothing and, and special effects things and even hired the amazing Randy, who was a magician, to help put together the show. Um, so we knew that there was going to be something outrageous, and but we weren't sure what. We had some experience with a little bit of outrageousness and, and makeup and with Genesis, who was on uh, initially on uh, Buddha Records. Um, and as for shows, I mean, we had, again, he had Sean on his name popping up. They just had a great show uh, where people would dance in the aisles and stuff like that to, to what they were doing. And I mean, they were dressed in 1950s outfits uh, on stage, but nothing quite as outrageous as Kiss was. Now, so it doesn't sound like there was any um, concerns or reservations about the band wearing makeup and becoming outrageous yet i i seem to recall a story very early on like right around just before the first album was released or something where neil asked bill if they would take the makeup off is there any is was there anything like that going on at that time or did neil have what no happened concerns was about with, it? when casablanca started we were funded and distributed by warner brothers um and the people at warner brothers well, there were only four of us at casablanca and one was Cecil Holmes, who only dealt with R&B stuff. So it was really me, Neil, and Buck who were dealing with Kiss. And Buck, not so much. Buck, more top 40 stuff. So Warner Brothers, is Mo Austin and, and Joe Smith, who ran Warner Brothers, asked Neil if the group would take their makeup off because they were getting some pushback from some of their employees at the company that, it looked stupid, it was dumb, and it was blah, 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 uh, because they had classy acts, <laughs> as far as they were concerned. And Kiss wasn't going to be a classy act, although they did have Alice Cooper, so I, 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 don't, I don't get that. But then Neil said, sure, I'll ask. But Neil knew, he never really asked. He said to a coin, they asked me, I told him you're not going to. He never really asked the band. He mentioned it to a coin that they had asked the band take the makeup off, and a coin, of course, said absolutely not. And Neil was, it was going to be absolutely not whether a coin said yes or no. But to keep things on a even keel with Warner Brothers, Neil said he'd ask. Sure. Okay. All right. So there was never any there was never any issues from Neil or or Casablanca about it at all. It was just cur not, it was just courtesy not, to not, your distributor. 
a distributor in person who was funding us. Right. Yeah. So, so, so let let's talk a little bit about that relationship. That you know, at the very beginning, you were you were funded and distributed by Warner Brothers, and that didn't last long. No, that lasted less than a year. Uh, let's, let's see, it was January, so lasted about a three quarters of a year. I'm, I'm guessing somewhere in there. We left them, I think, in September of '74, um, because we found out a number of things. We found out, I mean, they were working Warner Brothers' own product before they were working their distributed labels product. Um, if, if it came up where the radio station was going to choose between uh, Warner Brothers' own product and the Casablanca or Chrysalis uh, product, they choose the Warner Brothers product to push. But we also found out that Kiss, and at that point we had the Parliament also as an act, and both were selling eh, roughly 100,000 albums of pop, uh, but we found out that there was a pressing crunch in the industry going on. Uh, pressing plants couldn't keep up. So they put our stuff behind the Warner Brothers stuff. Uh, and we found out that we weren't getting our product out in the street because they weren't pressing it fast enough. And to be honest, uh, Warner Brothers was really nice about it. Uh, Mo Austin, who was the chairman, said, okay, you could leave. Once he found out about this, Mo didn't know about this until Neil brought it up to them. And uh, that was only because we spied on, on them in numerous ways. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we wound up um, leaving Warner's, owing them $750,000. I always like to say we were the only label that ever owed the money that ever paid them back. Hmm. Um, and we wound up with keeping KISS, keeping Parliament, of course. <laughs> they gave us the rights to put out an album called the Johnny Carson the 25th year anniversary album, which in a way saved the company, but in a way also put the company in large debt. Um, I thought that was a disaster. uh, Well, to a degree, it was a disaster. Carson in those days was huge. Anybody who appeared on the Carson show sold whatever they were selling and became famous. But it gave us the opportunity after leaving Warner's, we had no money. And we had no hope of money, but Neil was able to, because of his reputation, uh, sign up a bunch of independent distributors who all gave us advances on the Johnny Carson album, mm-hmm. because everybody mm-hmm. thought it would be such a big success. It wasn't, but those advances kept us in business long enough to get lucky <laughs> and have some success. Why do you think so that in a way album... it was? I'm sorry, Larry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I was just curious. Why didn't? Why do you think the the record? didn't do well when everyone else was betting on it. Because it was a record and not a video. Mm. Because Johnny Carson, to really enjoy the most out of Johnny, you had to see his facial expressions, or if he had Don Rickles or Sinatra or any of those people on, it, you had to see them do what they were doing. Right. Um, and um, one of the most famous things that ever happened on The Tonight Show was and I, maybe you'll remember his name, uh, but um, an, an actor threw a tomahawk at a stand-up, and it hit the stand-up in the crotch, and people went crazy. It was hysterical, blah, 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 but that doesn't translate into audio. Yeah. You know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, no, that totally sell, makes sense. We did sell probably 50,000, 60,000 albums, <clears throat> but it cost, I mean, Carson himself got 100 grand just to let us do it. And Ed McMahon, I think, got thirty grand to promote it for us and help us. And Ew. Carson only held it up. I uh, only held it up, I think, twice uh, on his show to to promote it for us. And each time he did, the next day sales increased tremendously. But he only did it twice. And um, but again, you know, it, it it really kept us in business for a good six months while we wangled our way out of the whole Warner situation. In in that that early period, there was Casablanca living like day to day, basically. Uh, well, let's put it like this: Neil walked into my office one day and and he said, um, "Do you have ten thousand dollars?" I said, "No." He said, "I got to make payroll." Um, and at this point, we had more people because we had our own production people and our own press people, and uh, because Warner's wasn't doing that anymore for us, so. 
we had to hire our own people. Um, and I said, well, I can ask my father. He said, no, 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 don't ask your father. I'll just go to Vegas. Mm-hmm. And Neil went to Vegas. Well, he was a big gambler, and he went to Vegas, used his line of credit in Vegas, and instead of betting it, he came back and paid the bill. Uh, so, yeah, we were on the precipice, um, to say the least. Now, now that that didn't sit well with the people in Vegas when they found out what Neil was doing, right? We were able to get the money back to them before, and that's when Vegas was very mob-connected. But also, Neil's personal accountant was the accountant for the Gambino family in New York. So he did have a little push when it comes to protecting himself on that level. Wow. The mob, be was a big deal. the mob was a big deal in those days, in, in, in the music, especially in the music business. Well, I, you know, that, that that's a good statement you make there. I mean, when you read your book, you read a lot of these other books that are out there, it's very evident that early on in the music industry, the mob was deeply involved. I mean, they were, they, they were quote, financing a lot of stuff. Um, how involved did the mob get in Casablanca and the Kiss career? It didn't because Neil, Neil one day he said to me, uh, when um, I'm trying to remember the circumstances, but basically what I said, well, did you, you know, ask Arnold to get some money from the Gambino family? And Neil said, because once you owe them, you never stop owing them, and I'm not going to put myself in that position. So, uh, yeah, they were there. And if you look back in history a little bit, Buddha Records was uh, was initially started with money from a mob guy named Sonny Francesi, who, when I joined Buddha, was in jail for murder. Um but the mob was definitely involved in Buddha in, in the early years, even before Neil got there. Now, this isn't necessarily directly related to Kiss, but what were your thoughts on the HBO series Vinyl? I hated it. I hated it because it wasn't true. It, 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 I mean, Jesus, it, everything about it was wrong. Uh, the record company itself, first of all, the building they were in, which I believe was supposed to be the Brill building. Uh, The windows were modern. In those days, the record companies, any of them were funky, except maybe CBS, which, you know, lived in this huge tower with the TV and, you know, huge corporate thing. But any small record companies like that company was supposed to be, it was a funky office for a company that had so much uh, stuff going on with black music. They only had one black guy in the, that you ever saw. You know, um, they they walked into a guy spinning albums and gave him I don't remember like a thousand dollars to spin a record. It's crazy. I mean, in those days, people who were spinning albums, if you were doing top forty, you were getting payola. But if you were doing album um, uh, radio. Um, like K San in in LA or WNEW in New York, or you weren't or KMT in LA, uh, you weren't getting paid any money because it wasn't worth it to the record companies. Uh, there was also a scene where I think he had a cell phone in his car. Yeah, nobody yeah. had cell phones in their yeah. car in those days. Nobody. I mean, I remember Neil bought me one when they first came out, but this was like. 75 or 76 or something like that. <laughs> and they wait a ton and you had to call an operator to, 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 to call the number for you. Uh, it, 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 there were just too many things that weren't real. And the way the guy did cocaine, it was like he never did cocaine before in his life. <laughs> you know, he'd do cocaine and scream. <laughs> what, what the fuck is that? I, I don't get it. So you saw a little bit of that at uh, Casablanca Records, you're saying? Just a little bit? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Larry, I, I wanna, one of the one of the stories I loved um, actually fascinated me, and I, I hope you can ex, ex, expand on it here. Wasn't Kiss? Or were you working to get them a number one? And I can't remember if it was Dynasty or what record were you counting on to get to number one? And oh they, no, that was a, it was Donna Summer. Oh, is that what? Is that what? Okay. 
yeah, we were up against the Bee Gees. It was really, thank God it's Friday, up against uh, Saturday Night Fever. That was at for um, Casablanca, and they, I mean, because it, it's Casablanca related, I, I think uh, I think the, the fans of the show would like to hear the inside workings of, of, of how something like that happened, because you were furious. And oh, well, yeah, I was not, I mean, uh, we had no, uh, the guy who ran the Billboard charts was this older guy, he ran it, uh, the, the charts on a yellow pad. And he, there was nothing scientific about it at all. And it was easy enough to manipulate him because he was, in those days, he didn't come out, but he was very gay. And because we had so many gay acts, you know, Donna, or acts that appealed to the gay community, you know, Donna Summer, the village people, um, on and on, um, he wanted to be really good friends with us so he can get to meet those people and be part of, the disco inside thing. It was really important to him mentally. Um, so we were able to play off that and get him to do stuff for us. I mean, it, it, a little bit, it, it relates to Kiss. I was able to talk him into putting five Kiss albums on the top 100 charts at one time. Not I, I, I remember, I remember hearing about it, that. But they didn't also necessarily deserve it. <clears throat> so, so he had promised me that Donna Summer... Um, uh, from thank God it's Friday and my age is my brain is uh, skipping me what song that was it was um, from thank God it's Friday oh uh, MacArthur Park I don't no know. no 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 that bad girl no 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 uh, I'll think of it before we're done uh, but anyway he promised me that of, of one of the BG songs from Saturday Night Fever. And I told Neil, and I told everybody, no problem, we're going to go number one next week, no problem. Well, I used to get the numbers before they were released, and when I found out, usually they came out on Tuesdays, when I found out on Wednesdays, and when I found out on Tuesday that we weren't getting it, I went ballistic, and I never, I mean, who would scream at the chart editor at Billboard, you've got to be out of your mind. <laughs> but it just caught me so off base, and I, I, you know, I don't remember if I was stoned at the time. <laughs> I could, I could, I could have been because it was, that was a frequent, you know, situation. But I just went ballistic and started screaming at this guy on the phone. And Neil came in because he heard me screaming. And then people from the other side of my office came in that door because they heard me screaming. Neil tried to calm me down, uh, but I felt violated because you know this was a promise, and I've done this guy tons of favors. Um. He paid for it later, but, you know, with other favors for me. But that's the reason I did it. It wasn't for Kiss. Oh, Larry, Larry, staying with that theme, again, I always say on, on the show that timeline is everything. Was there any sort of production meeting about Kiss doing something like I Was Made for Loving You, being that Rod Stewart and the Rolling Stones and a bunch of other bands had that sort of song in the charts? Was was it generic or or you know generically written or did you guys go you know what can can you write something like this I mean was there any pressure from the record label to the band to come up with a yeah. song like I was made for loving you Well, not necessarily. We they saw what was happening with our other acts in the disco genre, and they saw how big they were. And I mean, we must have had I don't know twenty uh, out of the hundred titles on the on the charts. We probably had twenty of them that were disco. Uh, that was selling some you've heard of, you know, like Donna Summer and the Village People, and, and a group called Santa Esmeralda, which actually was Casablanca's biggest record ever. Um, it was a remake of Don't Let Me Be Misunderstood, but Disco. Um, and Miko Star Wars theme beat the original soundtrack, you know. Uh, but Kiss was not selling quite as they did or as they used to uh, at that point. And um, we put some pressure on him to think about doing a disco song. Yeah, because I always wondered or if... Something, or something that could be thought of as a disco song without it being too blatant. Yeah, because not really, not only... It's funny because I Was Made for Loving You gets all the, I guess, jeers, if you want to say it, by a certain section of the fandom. But, you know, sure no something was every bit as, as, as of a groove song, as a dance song. And, and, you know, it doesn't seem to have that stigma attached. 
And, you know, I love both songs. But for my money, I actually like Sure Know Something Better. And I was quite surprised that that didn't really do anything chart-wise. And if you want to stay on the same record, one of my all-time favorite Kiss songs is Dirty Living off that record. Really? Again, I mean, all three of those songs have a strong dance beat, and I think are, are, are phenomenal songs, all three. You Matter know, of fact, people, I, I, well, you, know, you have to remember the, the time period. It was when that song came out when uh, people who couldn't dance and liked rock and roll, but mostly men, because their girlfriends were going to discos, and they didn't go because they didn't know how to dance or they didn't feel comfortable. Um, and there was a backlash against disco because of that. Uh, so diehard rock fans looked at disco as something terrible. And um, Kiss was caught up in, in, the, in the time that it was happening uh, with a you know disco-oriented song. But I think it's a really good song. I still hear it on the radio. Oh, yeah, they still play it here regularly. But I was like, again, I, I was always wondering, because if you go from side four of a live two to dynasty, it, in a lot of ways, it doesn't even sound like the same band. You know what I mean? It, well, the, the harder edge hard rock was certainly throttled back quite a bit. The beats were more danceable. I mean, it was a noticeable change. And, and even different, different producers, you know, too. I've always wondered how, how preconceived that was or was it organic? And and I, 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 I you know, I think you're kind of saying, you know, too we that, mentioned we mentioned to them, hey, you want to pick up your record sales? Here's what's happening out in the market. I mean, there were disco radio stations. I mean, it wasn't just, a, you know, a genre of music. There were radio stations that only played disco in major markets, New York, Boston, Chicago. Um, and we wanted them to. It was like. Um, when we had the big argument with them, um, with uh, what was the song that mentions all the states? Oh, shoot. Um, all America. No, all uh, the city. Let me know. All the city. Um, yeah, on the first record? No, on, on, uh, on, on Alive. I think it was On, Des- the, on Destroyer. America. Side four of Alive 2. I've been to Detroit. I've been to LA and I've seen St. Louis. All right. America. Right. Right. Well, that was a remake. Rock and USA. We had to fight this in order for them to do it. The interesting thing, the person who came oh, up with that stop, idea. Stop it. Hold on. Are you, you said the remake. Then that You're talking about one off the first record. The first record would have been a no. remake then. Yeah, that no, was the, was... Uh, the Bobby Rydell cover. Kiss in Time. That's right, one that, wasn't on the first, that wasn't on the first album. Kiss in Time was. Well, well, it was added to the first It was record. added, yes. Oh, yeah. it was added later, yeah. Yes. Because, but, but we got that idea from a guy named Scott Shannon, who's a pretty famous DJ yep. mm-hmm. in New York. Um, and he also has a syndicated show as well. But he was a DJ in um, down south in Memphis, maybe. And he came up, he was a top 40 DJ, but he came up with the idea of them doing that song. Uh, because Kiss and Time, Kiss, blah, blah, blah. So... Um, that was the thought, and Neil approached the band. They didn't want to do it. Their producers were against them doing it. Now, by the way, because Kenny Carter and Richie Wise were against them doing it and expressed that, that was the last time Neil used them for a project, um, which is a good thing because they got exposed to other better producers um, you know, later on. Um, and, um, yeah, they did it, but they didn't want to. Which is it's different with, with 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 Kiss in Time. You know, it, it was you could tell that that they were trying trying hard to get on the radio uh, with that sort of song. It, it it was very that is a very record company sort of. I don't know. Oh yeah, no, it was definitely an attempt to get to top. Contrived, I guess, would be the word. Larry, let me yeah, ask he, you. You know, related to Kiss in Time. We just had the the anniversary of the big kiss off, the kissing contest that in Schaumburg, and, Illinois, Sha- Woodfield Mall in Schaumburg, Illinois. What do you remember about that whole event? That it was kind of, it was all shoot from the hip. I mean, it was an idea. Uh, actually, Neil came up with um, because I got a call in the middle of the night from a radio station, WSHG in Miami, where a good friend of mine who ran the station 
said they were holding a kiss contest of who could kiss the longest. And I called Neil after I hung up with the guy, and Neil said, let's take it national. But Neil, everything had to be more than, had to be bigger than life. So what we did was set up with various top 40 stations around the country, again, trying to get to the top 40, um, where they would send winners. They would have a contest in their local market. The winners would go to Schaumburg, Illinois. We'd fly them in. And they, I don't know, we must have used 20 top 40 stations around the country uh, to get these contestants. Um, and then Neil, I, Buck, we would call at these 20 stations and give them updates on what was going on, especially with their contestants, as the contest kept rolling along. Uh, but it was great because it hit the national TV news. It hit newspapers. It really got us a ton of exposure. So it, it it was a really good promotion as it worked out. It you know you keep saying you know you're trying to get top forty. You want to break it a top forty. Was there a time where you felt like, okay, it's gonna break. This song is gonna break. I mean, because fr- from a fan standpoint, it felt like to me, Kiss never became other than Beth. I mean, you know, Beth is obviously it stands on its own. But leading up to that. Was there ever a moment where you felt like you were going to be able to get it, or did you just finally give up and say, this band will never be top 40? No, we kept trying. We kept trying. uh, Because in those days, in order to get the big numbers uh, in sales, you really had to get exposed on top 40 radio. Um, Yeah, that would drive the record. For us, Kiss were, were road animals. We kept them on the road constantly. Uh, and when any any anybody ever saw them, they became fans. I mean, people were blown away by them. Uh, the live performance, obviously. Um, and we still, as big as a live one was, and uh, we still needed to reach that other audience that didn't listen, that listened only to Top 40 Radio. Um, and we kept trying and trying and trying. We had some success. With a few songs, I mean, nothing that got into the top ten or anything like that. I was um, always surprised that was... "Shout It Out Loud" didn't do better. Honestly, just it, take my fandom away. That song really seems geared for that era of the '70s, and everything about it to me is such a perfectly written pop song. To this day, I'm like, I can't believe that didn't chart higher. I, I don't know if it was the stigma of Kiss, but "Shout It Out Loud" is a solid, considering you know. <laughs> What the music well, was like. you know, I grew up, the, uh, most of my attention was their first record, and I thought, you know, I love Strutter. I, they had so many great songs on the first album that I thought could be top 40 records. Um, but again, uh, the company was going through a lot of stuff. Um, the music industry was changing. Um, hippies weren't so, you know, Grateful Dead fans weren't so uh, numerous well, as they well, had been, they were still there. Larry, let's um, go back to let's go back to seventy four because if you guys at the record company were hearing songs like like Strutter, thinking you know that could get on the radio, go to the next record. There's nothing on that that you would think would even crack the you know single wise. I'm talking because I love Hotter Than Hell, but it just didn't sound sonically like anything you've ever heard before on, on, on the radio, you know what I mean? That can you, can you go into that a little bit? Or is that anything that, that, you know, what your expertise in this would be able to shine some light on that? Cause that is a brutally recorded record. Well, it was Turner and Wise still, yep. Yep. Uh, who really had very little, their first record they ever did for us was on Buddha, which is the group stories. Um, that did have a number one song. Um, but that was it. Um, and then Neil gave them Kiss to do because they were cheap and we couldn't afford it. <laughs> uh, and, a lot of, and, and a lot of producers looked at Kiss, a lot of big ones, and said, no, no, we're not going to involve with that. He's crazy. Um, so, but they had, they had, but they did have Kramer do the, the demos for the first record. You know what I mean? That was to me always... 
Eddie Kramer. The, 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 uh, epic, the Wicked Lester stuff, you mean? No, post that, um, Eddie Kramer uh, did five songs with them. Um, those, are those songs? The, the, uh, what is it? The Bell? The, demos. The Bell, bell Sound Demos? Yeah, because Bell, yeah. bell, bell Sound. Yeah, Bell Sound was a studio in New York. Yeah. Well, that was the part, I, I, and maybe you can help out here, because um, I'm geeking out here, this part. I always wondered, since they already had a relationship, however small, with Eddie Kramer, who, you know, eventually shaped their sound on Kiss Alive, um, how come they didn't go? Well, I think you already answered that based saying that Wise and Kerner were a lot cheaper. So that's probably why they went with them, but... Well, you they know, were a lot cheaper. Than Neil thought, Neil thought he could control them. Mm. Okay, that, because that's they were they were so. I mean, one of them worked for Cashbox Magazine, and that was Kenny Kerner. And Richie was in a couple of bands. Uh, one band on Buddha Records called Dust. Yep. Which was a hard rock band. You guys probably know a little yep. bit about them, anyway. Um, but again, nothing that ever made was ever successful on any level. Um, but I think most of it was Neil thought he can control them. He and, liked and, being and, able to do that. And in that's what way, why in what way though? In, that's Wait, why, it, why Neil came in for trust to kill, I think, to clean, clean this up and try and get a more poppy sound, I guess, or a more radio friendly sound because the difference between the difference between the first three kiss records the first one sounds sonically a lot more like the third one, the, the middle one, Hotter Than Hell, is just, it's in a league all its own. And it's, you know, like, again, I, those are some of my favorite songs, but that that is just a hard, hard listen uh, sonic wise. You know, it's, uh, I have just always shook my head at that. Like, how did that happen? And uh, I don't, I, I don't know. I wasn't in the studio at the time. Well, Larry, um, the, I was I was on the road trying to get people to play the first album. Larry, can I go back to your comment when you said that Neil felt comfortable because he could control them? In what respect? Uh, Neil would be in the studio a lot with them um, on on something like, for sake of argument, "Dress to Kill." I think it was Peter because Neil was short, also not quite as short as Peter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was wearing Neil's suit. Um, and it might have been Paul, too, that Neil gave them his suits to wear. Um, but Neil would be in there, and if he didn't like the way the song was going, uh, he would jump in and try to fix it in his mind. Um, and um, he had produced other albums in the past, never anything hard rock. Neil was not a hard rock guy. I mean, this is the guy who invented bubblegum music. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and his biggest successes, for the most part, was R&B music with Gladys Knight and Curtis Mayfield and, you know, who he could not tell what to do in the studio because they were famous already. Right. Um, and I think he wanted a band he could mold the way he wanted, which worked for a little while until Kiss said, no more. When did that happen? I can't give you a date. Um, but it was it was definitely after Alive. After the success of Alive. Uh, and the only reason, and I know people might know this, Alive happened, was we, we, we were pushing it for every six months to come out with a new Kiss album so we'd have product flow to give to the new distributors. And, and we had no money, as I had mentioned before. And Kiss was on the road constantly, so they hadn't had time to write any new stuff. So we thought the easiest and fastest way to get a new album out was to do a live album, which a band that never had a hit to do a live album was really nobody ever heard of before. Um, and Frampton, I believe Peter Frampton might have just had his big, huge live album then. Um, so the cheapest way to do it was to record it live doing a concert, which of course we did in Detroit. Um, and Kramer was the producer, as you said, but Neil was running back and forth into uh, the production. Uh, it was like a mobile home production thing. Um, if 
from from the stage to the to the back with Kramer. Um, getting involved with the production at some level again, I was out keeping the great people happy, so I didn't go back there. Um, I might have went back there once, uh, but here we were playing in front of I don't know fifteen thousand people or something um, that were already Kiss fans because Detroit was definitely a stronghold for the band from almost the very beginning. Um, and that's only because I was very close with the only major rock station in Detroit uh, that kept pushing and pushing and pushing the band. Um, and we did a couple of free concerts there also, which uh, sent people home talking about them. But um, Alive was only because we didn't have the money to go into the studio and they didn't have time to write new songs. Um, and it was just by luck that we, that happened because of course the album exploded, which we didn't think it would. I mean, it was just shoved out there to fill that six month period. Um, and shoved out there pretty quickly. Well, I tell you what, I want to stop you right there. Now a, a band with, with number one, you weren't expecting to, to sell a ton of records with that, but that also came with the very, incredible booklet and that had to add added some extra you know expense to the product not well, so much i mean it not no, so I, much just, i mean it was let's go ahead i'm sorry go ahead. no go ahead no, i i just it's it's funny of a band that's that's hemorrhaging money to to come up with them I and that was a that was a bold move to to take i mean because you would Again, think neil, you, neil, you, neil, you have to remember your, neil you have to remember Neil was a gambler. Neil gambled. I mean, he would gamble on two cockroaches running across the table and who would be first. <laughs> uh, I mean, he, he really was a big Perfect. gambler. I mean, Neil didn't go to Vegas and play slots or poker. He played Baccarat, which, which is big money stuff. Um, so this was a gamble, and, and they went for it. Boy, it sure paid off. Again, I'm asking these, these questions the way I am, Larry, because – I always say timeline, and this is a great example of it. These guys were, you know, didn't have a pot to piss in, and here's nor did the record company, and here they are going. You know what? We're going to do a double record, and then we're going to add extra expense to it by putting this beautiful booklet in it, and let's see how that does. I mean, it just defies conventional wisdom. <laughs> well, except that it, here was a band that you had to see, and we knew that. So the only way in those days. And by the way, we were one of the reasons we were one of the few companies in those days that did tons of video recording. In the Kiss case, it was because Bill Acorn and Joyce had the equipment and had the knowledge to do video. Um, that's why there's so much video out there on Kiss. And we would do everything we could to get them on TV, um, almost whatever it was. I mean, Neil actually hired a local L.A. newsman, TV news uh, anchor, uh, to help promote us to other TV news stations across the country um, due to the fact that they would all know each other and talk to each other and do each other favors. So we were getting on hard news locally all over the country because this guy was able to place videos we had pre-recorded on those news stations so and nobody had ever done that before so we we were trying at everything i mean one thing neil always did was try to think out of the box and it was important to have the booklet to show what happens during a live show the excitement that you know the color the the, the effects which you, without the booklet somebody picking up the album knew wouldn't know what, what was going on Oh, I agree. I, I'm one of those because I got it when it was new. My, I'm actually my older brother brought that home, and oh my god, that from that I was transformed right then and there. I mean, I still remember vividly just going, you know, are these guys from hell. <laughs> you know what I mean, this is this is you know the the, the pump. well. Part of it was also because if you think about it, teenagers usually like to do something that would upset their parents. <laughs> or show their independence from their parents. And I can't imagine any parent in those days seeing Kiss and telling their kid, this is great music. 
Oh, no way. Um, Larry, I'd like to ask you a question. Since you're out on the road and you're trying to get them played in different radio stations, what was how did things change once a live started to become successful? Did your job just get that much easier all of a sudden, or was it still a push even all the way through up and through Destroyer? It was a push on every album. Um, yeah, we eventually had a lot of stations that stuck by Kiss and loved the fact that they were there and they played the hell out of them, but there were certain markets a la San, Diego, uh, San Francisco where we couldn't get arrested with them. Um, no matter what happened, even if they played the market and sold out, and it, it, there were just markets that thought the band sucked and you know uh, they were embarrassed to play this kind of music from a band that wore makeup. And sounded the way they sounded. And reality is, you know, I know you guys love Kiss a whole lot, but we're not talking about the four greatest m- musicians in the world. Oh, um, yeah. no, I agree. Yeah. You know, the, but you could say that about ninety uh, percent of what you hear on the radio. I, I'm, you know, I'm not being an apologist, but not everybody who writes a pop song or had a hit is a great, you know, virtual. Oh no, absolutely. A lot of it. Look, a lot of it's timing. A lot of it's luck. Um, a lot of it's, you know, what kind of push you had to get on the radio. I mean, in the 80s, if you didn't pay a hundred grand to independent promoters, you weren't getting on the radio, unless you were Michael Jackson or somebody like that. No, I you agree. Know, and that's, was, how I, that's how come I brought up the stigma, too, because doing your job had to be hard when some of these people, like, based on their appearance, were dead set against putting them on the radio, which goes back to what I said about Shout It Out Loud being a great pop song. I mean, it's a, a rock pop song. It's got everything you, you want. It's got great lyrics that kids would get into. It's got a very catchy chorus, very short. Yeah, song. no, I, I, don't disagree. I don't disagree with you. But if you think about it, to answer the question about how hard it was, we were in Cleveland, uh, Kiss were playing the Agora Nightclub in Cleveland, and we talked the music director of a station WMMS, which is a big rock station, we mm-hmm. into coming and seeing the band, we actually handcuffed him to his chair so he wouldn't leave during the show. <laughs> and it I mean it worked. I mean that's the show also that uh, poor Peter his riser started going up. Nobody realized the ceiling was too low and he got knocked out. Uh <laughs> and knocked off. Nice. Um but, uh, but, no, we had to do all kinds of things, so, you know, to get people to pay attention to this band and to see. I mean, I talk about the first time they played Detroit. It was a free concert for the big rock station. Yep. And on the bill, and this is how the bill went, it was Nugent, Seeger, Kiss, and Aerosmith. And Aerosmith was much bigger than Kiss at that point. Uh, their album had come out earlier, and they were getting a lot more airplay. Um, and... Seeger and and, um, and Nugent were both local Detroitees. Um, and the bet was with the radio station, and I talk about it in the book, that within the first five minutes, minutes if Kiss doesn't blow away the audience, then they don't ever have to play Kiss again. If they do blow away the audience, they have to play Kiss like they're the second coming. Um, and because I knew that was a safe bet because I saw tons of shows that Kiss killed. So once Kiss went on and once Gene spit the first fireball, that was, it was all over. The audience went nuts. The radio guys looked at me and said, you win. You know, so those are things we had to pull off. We did so many free concerts for radio stations in those days uh, just to get them to back the band. It cost us a fortune that we didn't have. But it worked. When did Paola start to really come into play? It was always there on some level. Um, on urban black stations, more than Top 40 for the most part, because they got paid so little. Um, but even Top 40, even a big DJ, Top 40 DJ didn't get paid a whole lot of money in those days. Um, there were no like huge corporate radio stations. There were a lot of independent ones that at some point would join forces and... Uh, kind of be like a little network but um there were guys in chicago that were specialized in getting top 40 it was always top 40 or r&b play that payola was but uh it came into itself 
hugely when Radio and Records, which was a trade magazine, started giving stations a value. So a station in New York would have the highest value because of the population, and a station in you know Alabama would have the lowest value. Um, and so all of a sudden, there was a price tag you can put on the worth of a station. Before that, it was all a guess. Um, and the more pop major stations you got, you know, obviously that affected your sales and everything else. Um, so people started making deals with these, what they call Parallel 1 with the big stations, Parallel 3 with the smaller ones. And um, you paid anything from, what was it? Uh, for the small station, $500, $750 to add a record. The biggest stations, a couple of thousand. Um, and you did it through independent promoters. You didn't do it through your company employees. And that was um, early 80s. It's just, uh, early 80s, it started really kicking in. Well, it was yeah. no secret, though, that Casablanca supplied the party goods. That was the the rep you guys had, um, obviously I've read enough books and obviously you're a great one. We, we, we definitely supplied a, supplied a lot of party goods, but you know, we were open about it. We, Oh, exactly. Uh, That's my point. It, it, you guys weren't hiding it. There was no, you no, know, but other labels did as well, but they weren't quite as open about it. Correct. That was my point. That, uh, Larry, yeah, we, in fact, uh, uh, who was it? It was Walter Cronkite was going up in an elevator at CBS where at CBS corporate. And uh, I forgot what I think it was a 12th floor with the music. And when the elevator opened on that 12th floor, he said he could smell the marijuana. Yeah. <laughs> Larry, what do you remember about the first time Casablanca heard the destroyer album? I don't remember about the first time. I mean, it would have been, it would have been in Neil's office. Um, Do you remember what the where, label's initial feelings or reactions were? Because the stories are, it was a bit of a shock. Not that I remember. I mean, it was Kiss. It was something that we had to like, whether we wanted to or not, just psychologically, because they were our biggest band. Um, and you had to learn to love it, even if you didn't. Um, and, uh, negativity was not one of the, Neil's big strong points. So, uh, uh you, you kind of had to be positive, especially around him. He kind of would take whatever's delivered and turn it into a big show. He'd find the Absolutely. good, in, he'd find the good in everything. Uh, yeah, the, or the positive. Yeah, say. the positive. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Okay. Um, you know, so you talked about how I was made for loving you. The label suggested that Kiss might want to think about going something a little more friendly disco. Clearly, the you know, that Neil sat down and, and told Gene and Paul, you guys need to write an anthem, and that's how Rock and Roll All Night came out. Are there other instances? No, no, I told, I told them they had to write an anthem. You told them? Oh, okay. That's news oh, yeah. to me. I do. I told them that we, they needed something to close the show that would blow the audience away and make sure they got a, uh, um, a song. Uh, and I might have told them that. I'm trying to remember when. But I kept pushing them and pushing them to write an anthem. Um, okay. Well, my, my, my question is, do you which recall... Which doesn't mean Neil didn't tell them to also. I, I don't remember if he did or not, but... Sure. He could have. Sure. Do you recall other instances throughout the the seventies? You know, until until you left Casablanca, where the label was making suggestions to Kiss, whether it's suggestions about songs, touring, album covers, costuming. Were there other things? That album. You all right. The, 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 Kiss. The history of Kiss, and your your listeners will probably know this. Once Kiss got to a certain point, Howard Marks um, got involved. Howard owned an advertising agency. 
And that's where Bill of Coin got his money from to help with KISS. It's also where Bill had his office initially. Um, and Howard had a whole staff of artists and because he was an advertising company. Uh, so Howard was pretty much in charge. And he, and, he, and he talked to us about it, and he talked to KISS about it, obviously. Uh, doing all the album covers after, oh, gee, I'm trying to remember what album. Uh, probably around 76. Um, so Howard Howard and his partner Carl were their business managers. And uh, all the artwork went through them. We would see it to approve it and make sure there were no mistakes or make sure everybody's name was spelled right. Um, but they pretty much came up with most of the concepts for the next album covers for a couple of years at least. Um, so we, we didn't have that much input on that level on that stuff anymore. And after they became as successful as they did, probably again around 76, 77, they, um, we didn't have anything to say about what went on the record. They went and recorded and did what they did. Uh, at this point, they had they didn't need our input anymore, nor did they want it. Uh, we were still friends, and you know we we figured out stuff together, promotions and marketing stuff, and things like that. Um, but pretty much, but but at, at, again, I missed it because I used to uh, have huge fights with uh, Coin and the Kisses booking agent because they booked them in a way that made sense, routing them from one city to another, where I wanted them booked, depending on where I could influence airplay. So where I might want them in St. Louis to lock up the market with the radio station there and give them a free show, um, they might have wanted them in, you know, uh, Nashville or wherever, um, because it made sense routing where I was, and they could, save money and time by doing it their way. But uh, we used to get into a lot of fights about that. Um, but that was before they became very successful. I mean, after that, I had other things to do in other bands to work, and the company was growing so quickly. Um, my whole relationship with them changed, only not for bad or good, but I just couldn't pay as much attention to them from my time frame. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. Now, you know, we, we chatted a little bit about how the stigma of, of the makeup and just people would see Kiss and, you know, not not take them seriously, not 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 give you what you felt they deserve, what a lot of us felt they deserve. Was there ever a point into the 70s, moving into the late 70s, where maybe you guys at the record label were like, man, if we could really get them to take the makeup off now, it would it would help. No. No. No, never. At that point, it would have been killing the golden goose. Well, it wasn't the time. And, again, you know, uh, they weren't great musicians. They certainly weren't the best-looking band on the street in those days. <laughs> you know, take, take that makeup off, and that makeup to some of the guys really, I mean, Ace and, uh, just screwed up their 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 face <laughs> you know with yep, yep. with a whole bunch of problems um so no it never entered our mind for them to take the makeup off and so, no we really didn't want to do the four solo albums but we had to so yeah so talk about the solo albums yeah. i mean that that's a big historical moment in in kiss's history you know talk to us from the label standpoint about that we were given an ultimatum. The band was going to break up unless, and this came from Howard Marks. Um, the band was going to break up unless we could figure out some way to give them some space upon their own. Um, Peter and Ace were having a lot of trouble with Gene and Paul for various reasons, whether it be drugs, whether it be they didn't get as much credit. I mean, how many interviews did you see with Ace or Peter compared to, in those days, compared to how many interviews you saw with Gene? 
you know, anybody talked about the band or wanted to do an interview, it was always Gene. And it started getting on their nerves that they weren't getting, they weren't, weren't having as many songs in the albums as Gene and Paul uh, were, even though Peter had the only real hit. Uh, hit. Um, so, and once Neil heard the fact that, okay, they wanted to do four solo albums, it was, okay, if that's what they want and that's the only thing we could do, well, we couldn't change that mind frame. Neil was going to, as he was, a gambler, and he was going to make it as big and as noisy as possible. Uh, so that's why he shipped a million of each album. Um, they, according to contract, every album they put out had to have a $500,000 advertising budget. So right away, we, four albums, obviously, we were talking about a $2 million advertising budget. That's a lot of money, remember, back in the 70s. That's a lot in those, of money. In those, in those days, it, it was unheard of in those days. Um, and that's why there were stand-ups made, and that's why all, all that peripheral stuff was uh, to put them into record stores so people walked in and saw all this stuff going on. I mean, that's when there were record stores. <laughs> right. so, when there was a billboard in Minneapolis, of all things. So, yeah, you guys were doing everything. Uh, the billboard, there were TV advertisements. How many records had TV advertisements going on? Um, none that I remember in those days. Um, a magazine, full-page ads or, or, or fold-out ads for the four oh. albums. Oh, and they led up week by week by week, coming in September. Then there was the four empty one, you know, uh, and then they had, you know, coming this week. Every, I, I tell you, it was such an exciting part of being. And then, they had the, then we had the picture discs as well. Oh, you guys missed, no no opportunity was missed. Let's just say that. That was a, an but incredible. But they cost a fortune and they didn't sell. I mean, the, the Kiss fans weren't there. Not even for Gene, who was the best known. You know, uh, the New York Room made Ace's album the biggest of before. Mm -hmm. Which, well, that we lost, we lost. Aside from spending all that money on advertising, we had to take so many of those records back because they were guaranteed to sell, or else we had to, you know, take them back. It was, it was a catastrophe for us. Larry, you know, talking as as the, a young Kiss fan back then who got those and, you know, they were grandma gave me one for Christmas and my aunt gave me the other one. But do you think there was something to the fact that, you know, when I bl played those, when I especially the Gene and the Peter albums, as a young Kiss fan, I was shocked. It's like I was expecting rock and roll over. I was expecting Love Gun. And especially Gene and Peter had albums where I'm like, what the hell is this? This is not Kiss. It's Peter no, it Chris, it's, it's Gene Simmons, but it sure is not the demon. It's not rock and roll. No, no, and um, no, you're right. Okay, I tell you. I mean, it, it was what it was. I mean, we had nothing to say about it. We couldn't say anything about it at that point. And um, it's what really brought the company down eventually. Because keep in mind, at that point, we were very successful with disco. Um, and the Parliament were selling millions of albums, um, as well as some other groups named Cameo and a few others you probably don't know about. But um, disco was huge for us. I mean, it was enormous. We had three or four or five disco acts that would sell a million right out of the, right out of the gate. Um, but the money lost on those four Kiss albums put us in a really bad position. And it didn't really stop the inevitable because Peter Chris ends up leaving a couple of years later and everything kind of starts to go downhill. Right, right. And that movie, uh, what was it, Phantom of the Opera didn't help you. Kiss meets the Phantom of the Park. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and it almost seems like when you're dealing in situations like that, if if – if the minds of the people that are involved have been made up that they want to leave or change or whatever, it seems like that's just a Band-Aid on a gunshot wound. And at the end of the day, you never really end up solving it. It's still going to work itself out the way it wants to. Well, you're absolutely right. 
Yeah, but you know, being in the midst of it, you do what you do. What choice did we have? Well, what say? Okay, let the band break up. Who would want to go for that gamble? No. Right. Well, right. and we and we talked about it, and it's like we always thought too. An interesting idea would have been just like a double album with each member having one whole side. Oh, but then Howard Marks couldn't make his. Howard Marks. You wouldn't get the advances, right? Well, they right. wouldn't get the advances, which was five hundred thousand on each album as well. And Howard Marks got a fifteen percent commission on all the advertising, so he wouldn't have gotten uh-huh. as much. And Howard was in it for himself as much as he was for Kiss. Right. Um, so Howard made a fortune. <laughs> well, fifteen percent on the advertising—that's huge. Well, plus he got fifteen percent uh, or ten percent as a business manager, right? Uh, on all the money that came in, uh, you know, at one point a coin was making more money than any member of the band because he had twenty five percent of, and he ran the uh, merchandise. Yeah, plus you got to remember the other four then split the rest four ways. Right, so a coin was making more money than any yes. of the band members. Yes, I'm sure Gene wasn't happy about that. Of course Although not. Although they, I got to tell you, they worship the coin. Right. Well, and it's that's. It sounds like that's what the management management does. I mean, as far as like that split. And again, it's kind of like damned if you do, damned if you don't. Because if you didn't have Bill and you didn't have the people uh, like you and um, Neil and everybody else that believed in the band, they may never have gotten to where they are. Well, you know, Bill put his American American Express and the first the first year or so was chasing Bill at every opportunity because he just spent a fortune and never, pay, well, he eventually paid them. Um, but he used his American Express card to pay for tons of stuff. That, yeah, to um, keep the, so, keep yeah, the rolling. So, yeah, if you have somebody who was that committed in the beginning, they would have never gotten off the ground. Really. You know, you also have to remember that they were turned down by every record thing. You know, they, they had this Wicked Lester thing, which was exactly the same songs that appeared on the first album. Um, and I used to have a reel-to-reel tape of it, and for God's sake, I can't find it. Um, I'd love to have found it. Um, but, you know, it isn't like doors were opened all over the place for them to sign with the label. And why do you think that is? Do you think it was because of the what they were trying to do visually? Because the music stands up on its own, or does it not, in your opinion? I don't know that it did in those days. Okay. To an A and R guy at Columbia or Atlantic, or you know, that wasn't really, you know, if you were English and you came out that way, which a number of English acts put on makeup and you know stuff like that. Uh, it might have come across as, oh, that's cool, they're English. But these were guys from New York City, uh, you know, um, who didn't... And I, again, I mean, you know, a lot of these A&R guys look at them and go, but they're, mus- they're not great musicians, why should I sign them? Or the makeup. I mean, Warner Brothers would have never signed them on, on their own. You know, just seeing the makeup turned them off. So... um the man, you know, you just got to be lucky sometimes with what happens with who listens to your music and what kind of mood they're in that day. Well, I, I still say that that you know, Kiss's music holds up, and the, you don't sell this many records just because you wore makeup. It would be a flash in a pan. I, I've always championed their music first more than anything. But let's be for real too. You know, I was nine years old in 1974. What first caught me? Of course, the the the, the, the makeup and and all that. But you know what? I'm still listening to them. And there's still many many guys my age who are in their 50s who are listening to Kiss. It, it wasn't just something no, no, like, I, maybe, I, I was, like bubblegum music. I went to this new dentist the other day, and he's Chinese, very well educated. And his, his his nurse knew I had something to do with Kiss, and his favorite band is Kiss, and the guy's like fifty. It, it, uh, ex- that's exactly my, Larry. Exactly my point. That had it been everything the critics said in '74, no one would care in 2017. That's my point. Right. The music. Right. The, we were we were right collectively, us Kiss fans. We were right all along. 
we knew we knew great rock and roll music when we heard it. We're still getting great rock and roll music, uh, you know, all these forty some years later. And, and and you know what, critics be damned. And and keep in mind too, there's lots of other bands that go along with that as well, where you know they said they weren't very good and blah blah blah. You know, even even the early Alice reviews, you know, people didn't care. Oh yeah, but, no. Well, well, my 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 nephew is the lead guitar player in the Foo Fighters, and ever since he was a little kid, I used to send him Kiss albums when he was like eight. Um, Kiss is still. He was did an interview with, with somebody the other day. I saw. And he's still talking about how Kiss was his favorite band or is his favorite band and how much influence they had on him. And now he's in one of the biggest rock bands in the world. So I love hearing that. Figure. I love that. That's awesome. Larry, Larry, yeah, does, 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 do you sit back and go, wow, I can't believe what I was doing in 1974 has this. Life oh, I it. sit back a lot and and say how lucky I was that, especially those, although I did some other things after, but those five or six years uh, at Casablanca were just unbelievable. Uh, and it couldn't happen today. The music business is totally different. Um, but it, it was a different time. I mean, the 70s, you know, we were getting out of a war that had lasted for a decade the pill uh, came and freed women up for a whole bunch of reasons. There were just so many things. The president gets impeached. I mean, there's so many things were going on in the seventies that made it so different than any other decade. Um, you know, whether it be marijuana finally hitting the suburbs, um, cocaine being more available than just the jazz musicians, there was a whole bunch of things going on culturally in this country that were just amazing. Well, and that's all part and parcel to what was going on, I suppose. That's why it, it existed when it did. Because the music industry, for the most part, is a shell of its former self. So, oh, it's not, even a, it's not even a shell. <laughs> well, look, at, look at what's going on right now, and this is a modern-day thing. I'm, Larry, do you follow what's going on right now with iHeartRadio and... Uh... And, yeah, uh, they're they're on the verge of collapse. Clear Channel and they got one guy who picks all their music for all yeah. thousands of radio so away I, whatever. I will tell you, my my family used to well all, all my life. We always vacationed in Florida, and when I was in Florida, and this is when I was you know whatever ten to eighteen, we'd go to Florida, and I'd always notice the local rock stations there played totally different music, or, or not totally, but quite a bit more than they played here in Detroit. And, you know, I was lucky because I got to, you know, vacation down south and then come here. And and I used to hear bands down there more like, and a great example, I heard Molly Hatchet, her, you know, early on. And so, and I went and I bought it when I got up here. And the, I remember the record people, what? What, you, what is, who's that? <laughs> you know well, what I mean? in those I, days, because uh, stations were, we're not tied in together so so, so closely, but, but by one conglomerate or two. Yeah, but that's they, awesome. they each had their own, but, but they each had their right. own program director and music director, and uh, there were a lot of what we called the regional hits. So New York could have a huge hit and have a huge star in one artist, but you can move out to California, they never heard of them. Well, I'll, um, I'll give you the ultimate: uh, the band, the Rockets from Detroit. Opened for Kiss on the Alive 2 tour. Two years later, the Rockets were playing Cobo Hall for like four or five nights straight. Kiss couldn't even sell it out at that point. But if you go down to Florida, they'd go, who are the Rockets? You know what I mean? Because they were they were from here. They were big here. They got a ton of radio play here. Um, you know, through the Midwest, they did all right, but nothing like they do here. Uh, no, it happened with uh, a bunch of artists, um, New York-oriented artists that uh, couldn't get arrested anywhere else. Um, and and it, 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 it's too bad because what it did was at least give musicians an opportunity to get heard. Um, and sometimes it, because it was so big on the East Coast, you could use that to talk a West Coast station or into or a booking agent into booking the band. I mean, yes. Rush was nothing. Rush opened up for Kiss. 
in the beginning because they had the same same booking agent. Um, and without that happening, actually, I tell a story about we had hoped Angel would open for Kiss on their tours, but at that point we were having problems with Kiss. I think we still owe the money. Um, so they decided they would take Rush instead of Angel. I still believe to this day if they would have taken Angel with them to open all those shows, Angel would have really been big. Fair enough. Yeah, we had Punky on. I, I'm actually a big Angel fan. I like their stuff too. Larry, Larry, I want to give you. You know, we gotta we gotta wrap up here, but I want to make sure I give you a shot at uh, putting on your Gene Simmons hat and promoting and plugging away your book and anything else that that you're involved in right now. Well, I, you know, I've got, I've got, um, and it's the only one I have left. And it's, uh, there were only, I think six or eight made, uh, which I'm trying to sell. I've got a kiss gold eight track. I want it. That I want it. I want to mm-hmm. sell. All right. Uh, let's tomorrow. Yeah. Mark, Mark, Mark will buy it. We'll get you connected. If you don't have video. You can't see behind me. I've got walls of, uh, your uh, your ex compatriots here that I'm looking at Ken Anderson. Mark and... Mark, Mark is about as big a collector <laughs> as you could come across. Yeah, yeah, well, this only went we we did it as because nobody had ever sold a half a million uh, a tracks in those days, but Kiss did, which is interesting. You know, and it was the last year or two of a tracks anyway. Yeah. Um, and we only made them for the band. And a coin, and Neil and I. It's a gold yeah. eight. I've so, seen that award before, though. It's the Kiss Alive cause, uh, eight track, correct? Yeah, yeah, I've seen one before. Um, when we're done here, we'll. Uh... <laughs> it's it's Larry. It's sold. <laughs> it's sold. Okay. When Kiss and, retires, you know, he's going to buy them and put I them in his now, basement. What I do now is work on various. I get people, and it's interesting, mostly on talk radio. Uh, but mostly on syndicated shows, some music, but mostly talk radio. I get them exposure, whether they have a product, a book, a service, uh, a new album that might work in that genre uh, for one reason or another. The interesting thing, I used to do a ton of it for all the record companies. Um, You know, they'd come out with like a Roseanne Cash album, uh, doing all her dad's stuff, that last album she did, or two albums ago. And um, you want to get exposure to the audience who no longer listens to music radio, but would listen to Johnny Cash's daughter. Um, so where do you go? It's talk radio for that, you know, that demographic. Um, but that is pretty much ended because record companies do not spend money on marketing anymore, really. Yep. You know, and uh, what else is, which I'm sure you guys are well aware, I just read, which I found fascinating, a story in, about Bonnaroo, where U2 is playing and all these big rock bands are playing, but the biggest stage and the biggest audience was for EDM music. Yep. Which means disco is back full force. Wow. Because that's all it is. It, it's, it's the EDM is disco in, in 2000. Yeah, so. you're exactly right. Yep. Uh, uh, you know, you know. And 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 just make just to make sure again for our, our our newbie listeners, Larry's got an amazing book. I mean, seriously, this is an amazing book. It's called "And Party Every Day: The Inside Story of Casablanca Records." You can get it on Amazon. You know, you can get it wherever you buy your books. But it's a story of Casablanca. There's a big chunk of it's about Kiss, but you're going to learn about all the other bands that were also on the label at the time. Well, and, it's also the story about the record business in the 1970s. Yep, yep. Love, love yeah. that book. If, if, if you have interest in what the record business was like back in the 70s, read this book. Don't watch vinyl on HBO. Well, oh, you know, it actually helped. I've actually sold that book through my friends going, this is an amazing story. You know what I mean? This is a book you have to own. It is a, just an amazing, amazing read. I love that. Book. You know, I, want, I, wanted to do, I wanted to do a TV show on the book, kind of like a WKRP for now, you know, for right. then. <laughs> and, and, and after vinyl came out, all of the, everybody in Hollywood was saying, we'll never do it. 
show because vinyl was such a failure. Uh, so that's why I also hate vinyl. <laughs> <laughs> Larry, this was awesome. You know, and there's supposed. And there were rumors, and uh, spoke to the producers and in those times about there's supposed to be a movie about Neil Bogart uh, starring Justin Timberlake. I haven't heard anything in six or eight months. So uh, even though it was in all the trade papers that Timberlake is doing it, and blah, 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 um, I don't know if that's still happening you know, or not. Bummer, because that book was, what, Michael, because you're the one who told it was, me about uh, it. Was it Platinum? Going yes. platinum, something like that. It was that, called. That, that book is dynamite. That too. was a great book. Great too. book. Too. I tell you what, tell you those, what are, those are those are great two sister reads. If you know what I mean. Uh, if you're really into that, that. <laughs> <laughs> so, Larry, thank you for for taking an hour out of your day, sitting down and and sharing some of the '70s with us. This is this is fascinating. We've only touched a you know, the tip of the iceberg of what you've got to share from Casablanca and KISS related. Well, feel free to set it up again. I'll, I'll, I'll we can talk about other things. We definitely love do that. Well, we you, would love definitely. It. You're, you're welcome back. So we'll make it happen. And okay, uh, I'm going to get your uh, digits here, as they yes. say. And uh... <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll sell your gold eight track for you. There you go. Okay. Wonderful. Thanks. All right. Thanks, and Larry. Uh, any, anybody, and they probably don't, Want a Donna Summer or Parliament or Village People go album? Let me know. All right, all right. That's there you go. You guys just reach out to us and we'll connect you with Larry. Okay, right. fabulous. Thank, thanks, thanks, Larry. Larry. thanks, Larry. Thank you. Take three sides of the coin with you anywhere. Download your five-star rated free smartphone app today and listen on your Android or Apple smartphone. Visit android.threesidesofthecoin.com or ios.threesidesofthecoin.com. Like I said at the beginning, having somebody like Larry who was there before Kiss, that's freaking amazing when you think about it. He was there. Oh, I think the, Wicked Lester. Yeah, and it would have been fun to have a discussion with him just about you know, Karma Sutra and Buddha and just talking about the record industry in the 60s would have been interesting. Yeah, yeah for sure, for sure. So let's come up with some homework. Um, I, I guess first question, have you read his book and Party Every Day? What would you think of it? I mean, we've given you our impressions and, and where it where it stands in books related to Kiss, but have you read it? What would you think of it? Um, and then maybe... Uh, you know, another homework question could be, is there anything Larry discussed that you learned for the first time that was new to you? I, th I think a good homework question would be, because we, we're, we're going to have Larry back on. What question would you like us to ask Larry? There you go. Was there a question? Oh, was there an, a, an event Remember, from 74 to 80, was there a KISS event moment that you want us to try and focus in on and get some more details? Well, from 73. So, I mean, if there's something even prior to the first record coming out. Because Larry was there. He was there for all of it. Memories can be a little foggy. But, uh, yeah, what, what would you like to find out some more info about? I think that's it guys you know what you know what? before i forget we got to make another mention tommy that um in july we're doing a kiss meetup and we got to get on our get our ass get our here, ass. here and do something we something are? oh yeah i suppose um tuesday july 18th some at some point in the evening at somewhere yeah well, <laughs> we're really nailing it down here at some point in the evening, 7 o'clock-ish, 8 o'clock-ish, somewhere in the Minneapolis area, we're going to do a Three Sides of the Coin meetup again. So at least put it in your calendar, people. Put it in the calendar. Calendar. We'll, 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 we'll let you know whether it's maybe we've been thinking the Hard Rock Cafe at Mall of America. I don't know. Joe Sensors again. Something. We'll Something easy, convenient. We're just going to go out. We're not going to record a show there. It's just let's let's drink and talk kiss in a bar. What a novel concept. So put that on your calendar. That's it. Three sides of the coin. 
we're out of here until next week. Want to get your official Three Sides of the Coin logo and Shocker T? Now you can. We ship worldwide. Get yours online at shop.threesidesofthecoin.com. For interviews and media inquiries, contact Izzy at IzzyPresleyProductions.com. Download your free, free copy of the KISS School of Marketing. 11 Lessons I Learned Working with KISS. The number one downloaded business book on Noise Trade. Go to books.noisetrade.com slash Michael Brandvold. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. Love the show. Go to iTunes.threesidesofthecoin.com and leave your review and rating of Three Sides of the Coin. Thanks.